Good, good evening. Uh, I'm the aforementioned Brian Fedoten, and I'll give the commissioners uh, a minute to uh, to go uh, to their secret location, and uh, then I'll go through some ground rules. As, as stated earlier, we're going to be begin part one with brief presentations, first by Evergy, and then the Citizens Utility Ratepayer Board, commonly known as CURB, and then commission staff. Afterwards, you'll be given the opportunity to ask questions of all of them. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce Darren Ives, the vice president, or, or is it? Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Charles Kaisley uh, for Evergy. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. I think uh, I think folks can hear me. So uh, get the presentation pulled up here. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here uh, this evening. Um, I suspect that uh, most folks are here because they have a concern. Um, they may want to ask a question, a pointed question, uh, or uh, more likely, uh, many folks here are just outright opposed uh, to the rate case. But we are excited to see so many people here this evening. Uh, because participation is a good thing. And we've got many members of our company here this evening uh, from operations folks. There are people out uh, in the hall from customer service. So if you have a specific question about a sp specific bill uh, question or something unique to you, they can answer it. Uh, and we have members of management here, and uh, they too will get to hear uh, all the questions and the comments uh, that you have. Uh, as uh, Brian mentioned, my name is Chuck Kaisley, and I'm the Chief Customer Officer for Evergy. And to my left here is Darren Ives. He heads our Regulatory Affairs Department, which is responsible for putting together the rate increase, uh, the rate case that we're here to talk about tonight. Um, and, uh, and he will be available as well as I do uh, a little later to answer questions should you have them. Um, look, let's be honest. Um, nobody likes rate increases. Rate increases for anything, and, and in a time of significant inflation across the economy, uh, an increase in electrical rates isn't something that anybody wants. And frankly, it's not something that Evergy as a company wants to do. And so in my presentation that I'm going to make tonight, I'm not going to try and change any hearts and minds. What I'd really just like to do is tell you a little bit about what's driving the rate increase request as well as give you a little bit of context uh, as to where that puts us from an overall rates competitiveness and in the context of uh, our company, which is, which is now five years old. So, you know, there's been a lot of confusion at, at some of our other public hearings in this uh, rate case process uh, about who Evergy is and what Evergy is. Many people think or are confused that we're a new company, but but we're really not. It's a new name, but it's a new name for a company that was formed five years ago by two companies that have been serving this area and Kansas for more than 100 years. Five years ago, Westar, which served this area, and the, on the screen, you'll see a service territory indicated in green, merged with KCPNL, which is the area in blue. Both companies well over 100 years old, both companies in Kansas uh, and KCPNL also in Missouri. And at that point, we picked a new name. So it wasn't Weststar and it wasn't KCPNL, but this is the same company just put together to make operations more efficient. We're the same company, the same service territory, the same employees for the most part. We're still headquartered in both Kansas and Missouri. We have a very similar shareholder mix to that which we had five years ago. Our executive team still is comprised of a majority Westar and KCPNL employees. Our board of directors, the same thing. In fact, the chairman of our board is the former CEO of Westar, Mark Ruel. So we're the same company, and we're a company that has almost 100% of our assets and our business located in just Kansas and Missouri, the majority of that in Kansas. And when we talk about a rate increase request, a rate review, um, there's another little bit of confusion comes in and that people think, well, Evergy, one name, one company, this must apply to everybody. But 
We actually have two different requests. One is for the legacy KCPNL service territory, and one is for the legacy West Star service territory or the area in green. And that's what I'm going to concentrate uh, mostly on this evening, since the bulk, if not all, of the folks who are here are likely interested in what we now call Evergy Kansas Central or the former West Star service territory. So five years ago, I mentioned we formed the company, and as part of that, the commission, the very commission that is sitting here tonight to get your comments in this proceeding, had to approve that merger. And as a part of that, they set very clear expectations um, that were negotiated with many of the parties in the case, including KCC staff and CURB as to what the merged company should do and what we should achieve and what the priorities should be. They were conditions that we had to meet as a newly formed company. And I just wanna mention some of them because they provide a very valuable context for this request this evening. The first thing is that the parties and the commission expected to see meaningful reductions in the annual operating cost of the combined company. In fact, uh, as part of that, they said we could not come in for a rate increase request to our base rates for five years. And so we haven't. We haven't had a rate increase for five years. This will be the first one uh, that we've requested since 2018. The second thing is they expected to see significant savings. Now, in 2018, we estimated that we would see somewhere in the vicinity of $620 million of savings. As we sit here today, we have eclipsed that significantly and are over a billion dollars of cost savings that this merger between KCPNL and Westar has achieved. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. They said that we needed to, and we have, keep our headquarters in Kansas. They encouraged us and required us to remain consistent with or grow our community investment. So what does that mean? Well, here in Wichita, that means we haven't stayed the same. We've actually increased the amount of investing we do in the community. Many people have been down to Nasker Park. We were a huge part of making sure that that happened. We're now the largest contributor to the Greater Wichita Partnership, which is focused on economic development in this region. And that's because economic development for Wichita and the surrounding areas are critically important to us. And because we only grow if the community grows. And we have maintained or increased our funding in all the different civic organizations and charities that we were involved with in 2018. In fact, we did something that we're not doing a lot of these days, which is we actually opened up another facility in downtown Wichita. And so our commitment, if anything, has grown to be a part of this community since 2018. What else was required? Well, bill credits were required. And over the last five years, credits from the savings we have achieved have appeared on your bill and are part of the savings and part of the reason that we've been able to keep rates where they are. So let's talk about rates for a minute, because after all, that's what we're here for this evening. So the, the chart you see behind you takes a look at what's happened to rates since 2017. And this particular chart deals specifically with residential rates. And what it says is essentially this, since 2017, the blue area and the green area together have actually decreased rates. Rates have gone down 2.5%. Now in this area, Evergy Kansas Central, that's 1%. Residential rates are actually down 1% from where they were in 2017. So as we come into this rate increase request, which we're going to talk to a little bit, uh, a little bit what's driving that here in a little bit, just remember, over the last five years, we haven't had a rate increase request and rates are actually down 1% from where they were. Now, how should we think about that? Well, um, over that same time period, nearly 12% is the average increase in the states that surround Kansas for residential rates, meaning Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Iowa, Arkansas, Missouri, all have seen rate increases and rate increases significantly more than we have here in Kansas for residential rates. Also wanna point out that the orange bar there is the consumer price index. And that has gone up over 20% in the same time period. Now, 
that's a starting place. That's something that we have worked very hard to achieve. But one of the questions we always get uh, at hearings like this and in conversations is, okay, yeah, but rates were really high back in 2017. They grew a lot from 2007 to 2017. So where are you today? What kind of progress have we made? So this morning, I actually looked up some of that. I wanted to make sure um, that we had that information since it's been asked before. And I wanted to give you just a little bit of information there. So um, as of June, and this is compared to the Energy Information Administration, which is a part, uh, part of the Department of Energy. If you look back at 2017, retail rates for Kansas customers, that's all classes, not just residential, but residential, commercial, industrial, Evergy Kansas Central ranked 10th out of 10 at the very bottom. They had the highest rates uh, in the region. As we sit here today, over the last five years, we've made considerable progress. And now retail rates are ranked sixth out of 10, right around the middle, right around average. Retail rates for Evergy Kansas Central are actually ranked five out of 10. So slightly above or slightly, slightly below the average rate, meaning slightly better than average. In 2017, if you looked at a residential monthly bill, the average bill a residential customer had, we were the eighth worst out of 10, eight out of 10. As we sit here today, we're fourth out of 10 in Evergy Kansas Central. So not where we wanna be, we want to be at the very top of that. We want to be as competitive as possible. But over the last five years, we have made considerable progress, mostly as a result of the savings achieved because of the merger between KCPNL and Westar to create Evergy. So I want to take just a couple minutes and talk about how rates are made because it's this is this is something people don't really know very much about. And it's important to understand why we're in for a rate increase and what impacts rates. So all rates are, if you look at the very top, if you look at the, the words in the boxes, this at a very high level is how rates are made. It's the annual cost to operate the grid. And then you add to that any investment that is made and is actually in service to use customers. And then you take that cost up and you add it together and you divide it by all the kilowatt hours or units of electricity that you all and everybody else in our service territory uses. And, and that gives you a rate. So in my hypothetical example here, if you add $1,000 of operating cost and $150 of investment and you divide that by 1,000 kilowatt hours, you got a rate increase. You've got a, a $1.15 a kilowatt hour rate. Again, this is just an example. Now, what can we do to make sure that that's not as high as a buck 15? Well, the first thing you can do is you can reduce your cost. So if you look at example A right below that and you take cost out of it, you reduce it from $1,000 to $950 and then keep everything else the same. Still the same amount of investment in maintaining the grid, modernizing the grid, making it more resilient and still the same amount of electricity consumed, well, then you still got a rate increase from where we are today, but it's less than it would have otherwise been. And that's where our cost reductions come in. We, again, have seen more than a billion dollars of cost reduction. And I'm gonna show you shortly how that affects this particular rate increase request. Then the final thing, and I, and I put this in here because there's been a lot of conversation in the media recently about the Panasonic plant that has been uh, located uh, in Kansas. It's the largest economic development uh, project in the state's history, and we are adding um, investment to serve that plant, but we're getting so much more in usage that it actually is going to put downward pressure on rates even further. And so that example is the final example or example B. You still have your cost reductions that we achieved. You still have the investment that we're making, but now you're adding growth. You're adding additional usage. And what happens? It pushes rates down to lower than they would have otherwise been. In other words, the value of Panasonic coming in exceeds the value 
of the investment we have to make in order to serve it. And when you consider all of the other companies that are going to supply it, all the other homes that are going to get built, it'll have even a bigger impact. So just briefly, this is what we're requesting. It's, an, I think, everybody's uh, materials this evening, but it's for Evergy Kansas Central. This rate increase request is approximately $204 million of incremental revenue we would like on an annual basis, which equates to about a 9.77% increase. Now, if you, that's a lot. 9.77 is a lot. But remember, we haven't increased rates. In fact, rates have gone down over the last five years. So if you take that increase and you say, if it happened every year over the last five years, you'd still be at a little less than 2% a year, which is well under inflation over that same time period. So this is what it actually, this is what it actually looks like. Over the last five years, there's been more than $500 million of incremental investment in this part of our service territory in order to maintain and strengthen the grid. Um, and that equates to about $146 million annually, incrementally, uh, a year that we would like to see to repay those folks who provided the capital and provide them a return on their investment. The second thing that uh, we're doing is uh, depreciation rates. Uh, we're requesting to change depreciation rates. Now, all that really is, is principally our fossil fleet, our coal fleets, the expected lifetime of those units is decreasing significantly because of um, federal regulations out of Washington, D.C. Uh, could significantly curtail uh, our ability to run those plants in the, in the future. And so we need to take and, and decrease the amount of time that those are being recovered on the books. And so that's changing the depreciation schedule. That's about $55 million of this increase. And then there's what we're calling some historical and other, just a bunch of smaller items um, that we're requesting in this rate case. Um, principally um, um, in that category are, are three things. Uh, one would be Jeffrey Energy Center, which is a unit uh, not too far uh, from here, a couple hours from here. Um, we're giving another 8% of the generation coming out of that facility to um, this part of our service territory. The other is we've had some wholesale power contracts uh, that have expired over the last five years, meaning that we would sell excess power and that would come back as a credit to customers. Well, that power sales is now gone. And so that's part of this. And then we have the expiration of what was essentially a very unique rate credit um, that was put into place um, to reduce the impact of the Wolf Creek Nuclear Operating Station when it came into being uh, some 40 years ago. That rate credit is now expiring. And again, that's something that will uh, be part of this rate increase. So once you add all those things up, then you take it and reduce it by the annual cost savings allocated to this part of our service territory, which is right around $90 million, and that gets us to our $204 million uh, request. It would be significantly higher. In fact, uh, this overall uh, increase has been reduced by about 24% by those ongoing savings we realized as part of the merger. So I am going to, oops, there's a little delay, oops. <laughs> well, so I'm gonna wrap up here and, and just say that uh, there's gonna be a couple other presentations that'll talk to process and, and some positions. Um, we do have two people outside. So if you have bill questions or if there are questions, uh, for our transmission team or our operations folks, we can, we'd be happy to get you uh, in touch with them. Just come up and talk to me when we break before the commissioners come back in. We can get those folks for you. Uh, and then once all the presentations are done, I would be happy to uh, answer any questions that folks have. Again, thanks very much for being here tonight and look forward to the dialogue later. Thank you, Mr. Kaisley. Next up, we have David Nickel, Consumer Counsel for CURB. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> I am, do we have the PowerPoint coming up?
Before we start, my name is David Nickel, as Brian alluded to, and I'm consumer counsel for the Citizens Utility Ratepayer Board. I will, at the outset, want to tell you that my wife and I lived here for over 30 years before we left to go become consumer counsel up in Topeka, Kansas. We raised our three boys here. It is wonderful to be back home. You have such a wonderful town here in Wichita. Uh, I've had the opportunity to, to meet uh, some of you, but I want to thank all of you for coming tonight and for expressing your concerns with regard to Evergy's proposed rate, rate increase. I have truncated my remarks tonight to allow you a have a little bit more time to express those concerns that you have with regard to the Evergy's uh, rate case. But if you want the full version of public of Curb's public remarks at the public hearings, please go to the KCC website and click on either the Topeka or the Kansas City public hearing. But before I talk to you tonight about Curb's role in this particular rate case, please allow me an opportunity to tell you. Um, about CURB in general. CURB was formed in 1989 by the Kansas Corporation Commission. It was formed as a division of the KCC to represent residential and small commercial ratepayers solely, as it is impractical for those ratepayers to represent themselves individually before the KCC. In 1991, the Kansas legislature made CURB an independent state agency. Presently, it is separate from the KCC. It has its own mission, its own budget, and its own personnel. CURB staff currently consists of eight state employees who are directed by a five-member voluntary board. Some of you have met Dr. Daniel Burks, who is our newest board member. We're proud to have her. She's from Wichita. CURB staff consists of three attorneys, including me, three rate analysts, and three administrative professionals. The governor appoints the five board members of CURB for four-year staggered terms. One board member is appointed from each Kansas con congressional district, and one board member is appointed to serve at large. These are the present board members of CURB. CURB's primary duties are to represent residential and small commercial ratepayers before the KCC, before the Kansas legislature, and before the Kansas appellate courts. CURB also performs additional functions such as customer outreach, and utility-related policy research. Turning to this rate case, CURB's role is to argue for how residential and small businesses view the proposed rate increase. Yet CURB does not decide what rates customers will pay. That decision is made by the KCC commissioners that you heard speak earlier tonight. Rather, CURB is only an advocate in this matter. But as the consumer advocate, it is not surprising to anybody that CURB will argue for the lowest reasonable rates. So in this rate case, CURB will present evidence as to what reasonable rates would allow Evergy to provide the reliable service that Kansans need. CURB has retained a number of experts, consultants, to help us analyze this question. And although CURB's experts are still formulating all of the contested issues, all of the evidence, all of the testimony that Curb will eventually present in the technical hearing, there are a few general issues that I can highlight. In this case, Curb notes that Evergy is asking for substantial capital investment, recovery of capital investment. In particular, as Mr. Kaisley alluded to, the application shows that Evergy Kansas Central has incurred $480 million in, in, as an increase in the level of physical plant investment since its last rate case and projected through June 2023. Moreover, Evergy is asking for a rate of return on shareholder equity at 10.25%, up from 9.3%, and an increase in depreciation expense. Curb will address all of these matters, expressing the amount of investment that Curb believes is necessary to serve customers and an appropriate depreciation expense. Curb will also testify as to a reasonable rate of return for shareholders. 
In addition, I would like to note that Evergy has asked to raise the customer service charge to $16.71 from approximately $14 per month. Curb will present evidence regarding what it considers to be an appropriate customer charge. There are several other issues that Curb is presently evaluating and concerning which Curb will present testimony at the technical hearing as it's heard. At this point, we don't know what all of those issues are. We're still studying and evaluating the rate application. However, I want to emphasize that Curb is fully engaged in this matter. We want to keep rates as low as legally permissible for, for the constituents that we represent. As we have in other rate cases, Curb will treat the need for any rate increase with considerable skepticism. We acknowledge that only a very small increase in rates can still be very difficult for some consumers. Your testimonies will illuminate the energy burden that Kansas face, and we thank you for that. So thank you for attending this hearing. Your concerns are important to everyone here. Our contact information for CURB is shown. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Nickel. And now uh, Carly Massantine of the litigation staff of the commission. Okay, good evening, everybody. As Brian stated, my name is Carly Massantine, and I am an attorney who works for the Kansas Corporation Commission. I'm here tonight to give a high-level overview of the commission and how it operates, as well as explain how my clients, the staff of the Corporation Commission, analyze Evergy's rate increase application. For clarity's sake, I do not represent the commissioners, nor do I represent the agency as a whole but rather I represent the group of state employees who make up the utilities division within the commission. Next slide, please. Oh, I do, there we go. So the commission is a state agency headed by three commissioners who act collectively in determining the matters that come before them. The current commissioners are Chair Susan Duffy, Commissioner Dwight Keene, and Commissioner Andrew French. The commission has jurisdiction to oversee a number of industries that operate in Kansas, from electric and natural gas to oil and motor carriers. The agency employs a staff of professionals who are available to provide guidance and input on the various technical aspects and issues that are involved in regulation of each of these industries. So administrative hearings at the commission look very similar to that that you would see in a district court. The commissioners act as judges, they hear and weigh the evidence and issue orders that then can be appealed to higher courts. Staff, my clients, act as a party to the case. They develop and further their own positions, recognizing that staff's duty is owed to the state of Kansas and to the general public. And up on the screen here is a visualization for you of how it's all set up. So you can see at the top of it there the three commissioners. And parties involved in the case include the applicants, which in this case is Evergy, as well as the commission's technical staff and numerous other interveners who represent a variety of interests. And we will touch on that just a little bit later in the presentation. But as you can see, and what's important to visualize here is that each of these parties are distinct and separate parties to the case. And just like at court, it's the attorney's job to present each party's case to the commission. So the commission staff, my clients, are dedicated state of Kansas employees who have a tremendous amount of experience in education and professional knowledge in fields such as accounting, economics, engineering, and complex financial analysis. And during proceedings before the commission, staff advocates again for the general public, which is another way of saying that staff's main goal is to promote the public interest of the state of Kansas as a whole. So staff has the ever challenging job of objectively looking at all of the interests at play in the case and providing an independent, neutral and balanced recommendation to the commission that furthers the public interest as a whole. 
Now, I'm not going to reiterate all the details of Evergy's proposal, as you heard it from them, and most of you are here tonight because you have heard it prior to that and you have concerns about it. So I thought what might actually be more helpful at this juncture is to walk back a bit and give a bird's eye view of the process. So I often have friends and family when they find out what area I work in, ask me to explain how it's possible that utilities in Kansas are allowed to be monopolies or some question to that effect. So an electric utility provides a type of service that's extremely complex and unique with high startup costs that make new market entry difficult, if not impossible. And once an electric grid is in place and is set up to deliver power to all of the homes in any given community, it makes little sense to develop a secondary grid to essentially effectuate that same service. In addition to redundancy of both assets and costs, that could also create confusion when you, if you would, were to have two technical grids operating in one area. And to reiterate that idea, there actually is a Kansas law that states there cannot be two electric suppliers in any one given territory. Uh, it's called the Retail Electric Suppliers Act, but it's been shortened to RESA. And a part of the KCC's function is to classify and map each territory and ensure that any territory overlaps that have inadvertently taken place are remedied so that the utilities are not in violation of that statute. So going a little bit further into the policy behind this structure, I wanna focus on a concept called the regulatory compact. And the overarching idea behind the regulatory compact is twofold. One, electricity is too important of a resource to be left entirely to a competitive private market. In the modern world, you could make arguments that electricity actually is our most important resource. I mean, you would be hard pressed to adequately locate and store food or sustain shelter without electricity. Yet private industry, no matter what type of good is being sold, whether that's kilowatt hours or otherwise, is about a bottom line. And you can call that what you want, but without that profit margin, there is no reason for any industry to exist ever. But left unchecked, it's possible, and we have seen this happen, not in Kansas, importantly, but in other states, where when it's not economic for a utility to go out then and buy power if they are not regulated, sometimes that utility just won't go do that. And then the lights don't turn on, and that can be devastating to human life. But conversely, it also isn't the most efficient thing to have the government be trying to run the electric grid on its own. That is a highly technical endeavor that requires expediency and technical proficiency. So in order to achieve both the benefit of efficiency and assurance and public protection and access to this important service, the idea of the regulatory compact developed in law over time, where utilities are granted an exclusive service area in exchange for being fully regulated. So here are just a few very high level sources of law behind the idea of regulatory compact. Kansas statutes require Evergy to provide efficient and sufficient service at just and reasonable rates. And the Kansas Supreme Court has weighed in and added some definition to what just and reasonable means. And that standard is what guides the commission in proceedings like these. So when staff looks to determine that all of the interests at play are balanced, we also, we are particularly attempting to find a balance between the interests of Evergy shareholders and its ratepayers, as well as ratepayers of today and the future. And in addition to the Kansas specific law we just discussed, there is also a constitutional basis for why the utility is allowed to earn a reasonable profit on its investment in the equipment and staffing required to operate the electric grid. You have to remember the utility is a private business investing private capital to build and maintain the electric grid. Yet its assets are used to provide a necessary public service. So above and beyond our Kansas specific statutes, there is a constitutional principle that the utility's property cannot be used for public purposes without just compensation. So again, the law is explicit in allowing Evergy to collect through its rates, the reasonable and prudently incurred cost it incurs to run the electric grid and in addition to that, the law provides that Evergy has an opportunity to earn a reasonable profit on that investment. So before we get into how specifically the KCC goes about finding that proper balance, I wanted to zoom out a bit on all of the different parties that are involved in this process. You've heard tonight from Evergy who represents 
represents its interests and those of its shareholders, as well as from CURB, who represents the interests of residential ratepayers like yourselves and small businesses. Other parties in this case, for example, we have various gas companies that operate in Kansas, as well as a couple oil refineries, the United States Department of Defense, the Kansas Chamber, the Wichita Regional Chamber of Commerce, the National Resources Defense Council, various large industrial businesses and manufacturing plants, the USD 259 here in Sedgwick County, um, all of which have been granted intervention with more yet still pending. Now these parties all will review Evergy's application and are free to make comments on any aspect of that application that concerns their particular interest group. These parties file testimony in the docket, engage in the data sharing process, and participate in any legal proceedings that may occur. Now, all of that makes the record of evidence upon which the commission is going to base its ultimate decision. So if you remember back a few slides, one of the prongs of the reasonableness test that I discussed that came from the Kansas Supreme Court requires the KCC to analyze and factor in the public interest as a whole when ruling on Evergy's application. The public interest means the state of Kansas as a whole, which is represented in pieces through each of the parties who are involved in this docket. KCC staff, again, is tasked with balancing all of those individual and unique interests and in representing the public generally and the state as a whole. So the commission staff are currently undergoing an independent review of Evergy's application. This review includes an in-depth examination of Evergy's finances, which allows staff to evaluate the application for accuracy and for compliance with Kansas law and the commission's regulations. The investigation also includes identification of any positive or negative impacts on customers, the utility, and the public generally. During its investigation, staff determines which costs the utility is entitled to recover in rates, but perhaps most importantly for the audience tonight, which costs maybe aren't necessary to be included in rates. And finally, staff will evaluate the structure of the utilities rates to ensure that they are fair and are based on the underlying costs to serve each particular customer class. After its investigation is complete, staff submits written testimony that indicates its position on the application. And staff will actively participate in the rate case process by advocating for that position throughout. Staff's role is not to help any one party over the other, but again, to provide an independent, neutral assistance to the commissioners in balancing these competing interests and evaluating the total impact of the application on the state of Kansas. So an important date to remember here is August 29th. That is the day that staff is going to be filing its direct testimony in the docket. And staff's testimony can be accessed through our website. Um, it's a little bit of a, it's just a quick process. If you go to kcc.ks.gov, you can kind of toggle through the tabs there to get down to where you can actually input the docket number, almost like a Google search, and it will bring up the repository of everything that's been filed in this docket thus far. So for those who are interested, you can actually follow along and on August 29th, pull up and read that testimony as it's being filed. So up on the screen are the remaining deadlines in the docket. Another important deadline to remember is September 29th, which is highlighted in red here. That is the day that the public comment period ends. So if you intend in any form or fashion to submit a comment in this period, you must do so before September 29th at 5 p.m. And finally, I'm gonna leave this up for the remainder. Um, I just wanted to leave you with information on how you can submit a comment, the different ways you can do so. So feel free to screenshot or write this down. So in addition to tonight live, you can also make a public comment by sending them to our public affairs office by online, by mail, or you can call by phone. And the information for each of those again is on the screen. And as I mentioned previously, you can also follow the all of the proceedings on our website. And we do have a YouTube channel. Uh, it's just Kansas Corporation Commission. You can watch in addition to any legal proceedings that take place in this particular docket. There all, also are some really interesting workshops on there, but other issues going on in the energy world. Um, so for those who have interest, it's a really educational source. But I wanted to close out by reiterating what those before me have said, which is we really do appreciate your participation and we appreciate the fact that you took the time out of your day to come down here and be with us um, in person or whether you're listening on, on through Zoom. Uh, these comments will get filed in the docket and they become a part of that record of evidence that the commission uses to make its decision. So they are valued and we do appreciate it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Massentine. Now you'll have the opportunity um, to learn more about Evergy's request and the, the process. So please limit yourself to questions at this stage and save your comments until the commissioners return so they can be recorded and added to the official record in this case. We also ask that you limit yourself to one question to ensure that as many questioners as possible have the opportunity to participate. Uh, for those of you participating by Zoom, um, you can let us know that you have a question by using the raise hand feature on your computer. Uh, when, you, when we call on you, you'll be able to unmute your microphone. Um, we will go back and forth uh, between in-person and Zoom questions as necessary. Um, for those of you uh, in Wichita, we have a microphone set up in the aisle. So please take turns, uh, step up to the microphone, um, state your name and your, your city, and uh, I will monitor Zoom to check for raised hands there. So we're, we're ready for questions. Thank you for this open discussion. My question has to do, it's a counting question to staff. Depreciation expense is being increased because you've shortened the useful life of the assets. I don't think that's fair to consumers that because of an accounting change, depreciation expense is going to, one of the reasons you're increasing rates. So I would say, take a look at what it would have been if you hadn't shortened the useful life, hadn't increased depreciation. And also since Panasonic is requiring so much capital, look at their depreciation expense and hold them accountable for their increase in rates due to capital and the related depreciation. That's my question. Have you analyzed that? Thank you. Got you know, depreciation expense is part of your accounting for the rate increase. Yeah, Sorry. I, I, Sorry, we're having mic issues. I'm, I'm not sure if mine. Oh, okay. here. There we go. Mine. Thank you. Yeah. So, sorry for the delay. I, I tried to turn mine on earlier, and I don't, I don't think I actually have that control. So my name is Justin Grady. I, I work in the utilities division. My section is the section that's uh, primarily responsible for reviewing the topic that you raised. We, we do revenue requirements and depreciation analysis. We have a depreciation consultant that that actually does this all over the country. It's um, it's uh, it's a pretty specialized, unique area of regulatory experience. You know, what I would say is just as a reminder, we haven't filed our position yet. We filed testimony in about a month and the company has a position that they want to increase depreciation expense in order to recover the cost of their plants over the period of time that they currently expect those plants to run through their integrated resource plan. Um, but, you know, there, there may be parties in the case that say, well, well, that's the current projection of when those plants are expected to retire.
Uh, what's important to note is a, a couple things. One, uh, that is completely a shareholder expense. So none of that is recovered uh, through rates or even requested uh, as part of a rate increase uh, request like this. And the second thing is uh, we are very transparent um, about who gets it and where and when and all that is available, not just uh, uh, from us, but also on various uh, online uh, state places. So it's, it's, it's available for anybody who wants to get it. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a quick Zoom question, and then we'll we'll go back to the the uh, people in, in the room. So, um, Christy Launderholm, um, are you there, Miss Launderholm? Help, if I, I have, am. Okay, hopefully I didn't bungle your name too badly. You did perfect. Thank okay. you. Good. Thanks. So my question is for Charles Kasky I, uh, with Evergy. I'm looking at the actual filing itself and the metro increase, and I'm particularly looking at residential because I'm in the metro area, I missed when you were here, is 5.9%. But as I'm looking at this, the proposed increase it looks like for central is 24.9%. So I, I would like some understanding about how that came about over time. And if it's related at all to the type of energy used to generate electricity, because I recall from Storm Uri that today I'm getting an actual credit refund from the storm while Central is paying. So can you address that? Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, okay, it's on. Uh, so that's a great question, and uh, it highlights something that I probably should have been a little more clear on uh, in my opening remarks. You know, again, we do operate under one name, so we share companies across different service territories, both in Kansas and in Missouri. Uh, there's a lot of shared assets, for example, uh, IT systems, accounting systems, things like that are shared, but the green and the blue sections that you saw earlier are distinct service territories. They have distinct power plants that serve them, distinct lines that serve them. And as a result, they have a distinct cost basis or a different basis in how rates are set. And um, so it is true that the rate increase request for the metro area and the rate increase request for the central area is different because it's based on different systems, different investments. It may be worked by the same people, but it's it's it, they're completely different cases. You're also it is also correct. Um, you mentioned I think that during URI, uh, customers in Metro are getting uh, received a credit for that. And that's based on the fact that we sold power off system and that power, um, the, the value of those dollars came back to those customers. It was, it was, it was from Metro power plants, principally coal, um, uh, that uh, was the difference. Whereas um, that was not the case here in Central. I would note that while the increase is uh, larger in um, Central than it is in uh, Metro, if, if we look just at rate competitiveness, um, Central still has lower rates overall than the Metropolitan uh, Service Territory. And I just, just since since you ask, I'll give you I'll give you something to compare by. So as of uh, June, so this June, uh, residential um, rate for kilowatt hour is twelve dollars and twenty cents, or excuse me, twelve twelve point two cents a kilowatt hour. Whereas in the metropolitan area, it's about 14.6 cents a kilowatt hour uh, for residential customers. So you can see that there still is a significant rate differential overall. And uh, even with this, this rate increase request, if all of it were to be, to be granted, Central should still be um, below the residential rates in, um, in uh, the metro area. May I make a quick follow up? It, it, then is there any uh, intention to blend the two service territories together in order to, I don't know, economy beats the scale would even come into play, but to redistribute the cost for sure. So, so I think that that's a that's an excellent question. And so, first of all, where we can blend them from a from an operations perspective, we're doing that, and that's where the billion dollars of cost savings come from. We don't have two IT systems anymore. We don't have two phone systems. We have one purchasing department. Um, we've streamlined parts 
uh, and and standards across the service territories where where wherever it's possible. When it comes to the actual assets, though, that serve the different customers, those have grown up literally over a hundred years and are very different. They're just a, it's a different mix of generation. It's a different mix of of wires and substations. One of the differences for Central is as you can see in, in the map that we put up is the just the surface area covered in Central is you know massively big as compared to um, the metropolitan area, which is a very compact area. So just the amount of wires uh, you know, it takes to serve Central is significantly greater than it is in Metro. So as a result, um, we have two different cost bases, two different rates. Would we like to ultimately bring those uh, two groups together? I, I think yes. Ultimately, that would benefit customers. But here's the thing. There's, there's winners and losers when you do that. And so you might want to have uh, access in Central to uh, the $100 million or so credit from URI, but you probably don't want your kilowatt hour cost to go up and meet that uh, of of metros and and it's those kinds of trade-offs that you have to look at uh, when you're thinking about something like that over time I think you will see as we start to operate them together um, I think you will start to see the rates uh, come closer and I think you will see um, maybe a case can be made to do that but right now there probably be too many winners and losers that it would it would probably make more people upset than it would um, help and we want to try to get to as many of you as possible. So just as a reminder, please try to limit yourself to one question. So pl please proceed. Uh, yes. Good evening. And thank you for being here. I am Oletha Falskudo, uh, state senator for the area that we're in right now. And just for clarification, so this line is just to ask a question and then you'll do the comment section yes. later. Okay. Thank you. So um, in... For Evergy, my question is: so the uh, the the system wide rate increase is about nine point seven seven uh, of an increase. So, what is that for the residential customers uh, here in Wichita, or is that compared statewide? And so, I guess just for layman's term. Uh, um, constituents who I've talked to want to know is that uh, would that be like $14 a month or $16 uh, increase as you stated in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you, Senator, uh, outside of the Capitol. Um, so in Evergy, Kansas Central, uh, the overall increase is 9.77% which for the average residential customer is going to work out to be about $14 and 24 cents a month. Now, if you have a bigger house and you are a bigger customer, it would obviously be a little bit more. And, and if you are in a smaller um, domicile house apartment, um, then, then it would be a little bit less, but that's, that's the average. Okay. Bill Newton from here in town question um, about two years ago, Spirit has several different locations in different states, and their energy rates were way cheaper outside of the state. And we listened to you talk about how your rates are pretty good. And my question is, is why did you tell them no for a while? And then both of you capitulated and lowered the rates to them. I think that says something about where our rate structure is at already, regardless what you said about how great the rates are. I've been I've been a utility employee, so I kind of know the game. Is there any way that you can separate out the energy rate versus all of the other meter charges and all the transmission charges so we know what you're charging us? Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm I'm gonna go talk about spirit first and then I think there might have been another one there. So stick around just about sure. I want to make sure I answer sure. your question. <laughs> So let's talk about Spirit. Prior to Evergy becoming uh, a company, um, yes, there were some conversations about um, getting a reduction uh, or a, a special contract, essentially, uh, for an expansion that was planned here. For a number of reasons, that didn't happen. 
when the two companies merged, um, one of the first things that we did was sit down with Spirit and talk about what was going to be necessary for their long-term viability here in this region. And I want to say this unequivocally. There's, we understand how important Spirit is to this region. This, this region has to have Spirit, and we want to see Spirit thrive and grow. We want to see more employees out there, not less, and we want to see expansion here. And as a result, the revised company and the blended management team sat down with Spirit and over about a year period negotiated a special contract. Now, there are a lot of things that I can't tell you about that contract because it's part of um, their competitive advantage and it's something they don't want shared. But what I can tell you is it was a significant reduction. What I can tell you is that it dedicated uh, better than 100 megawatts of wind energy to them, which also helps them sell not just here, but abroad and in Europe, their products. What I can tell you is there's no higher priority for us in Wichita than maintaining them and the aerospace uh, and, and airline industry here because it's such an important part. Look, at the end of the day, um, you can say what you want about monopoly status because, as Carly mentioned, we have 100% market share. The only way we grow, the only way we thrive is if Wichita, the surrounding communities, and Kansas thrives and is competitive. And so to that end, that's why we did that, that deal. It was ultimately um, agreed to uh, by the commission. It's a, it's a long-term contract that gives them some certainty, and we will continue to be partners for them in any way we can uh, to, to do everything we can to make sure they grow here and not somewhere else. Now, I think the second part was about bills generally um, and all the different charges. So there are their base rates, right? Which um, get reset in a proceeding like this. And then there's things like the transmission uh, delivery charge. There's things like a, there's a fuel adjustment and things like that. The reason that those things uh, exist is because um, they are many times outside of the company's control, meaning that fuel, fuel is what it is. We pass it through dollar for dollar. There's no markup on the fuel and it goes up and down. And so it's volatile enough, particularly natural gas, but even coal in recent years, once you add in transportation has been pretty uh, volatile, that big swings in those costs um, could drive us into what we call serial rate cases. We, we'd always been be in rate cases. And you don't want that. We don't want that. And so there is a mechanism to adjust those up and adjust those down. I think what's really important to remember um, here, though, is because we haven't had a base rate increase in five years, that means the only change in our bill has been those charges. And as I mentioned in my remarks, the net cumulative effect, they've gone up and they've gone down, more down than up in the last five years, but the net cumulative effect of those charges for residential customers has been just under a 1% decrease over that time period. I mean, it, it, they may have gone up, but they've gone down more, netted out essentially, but we're down about 1% as we come into this rate case. So, so the, the answer was you're going to break out the kilowatt hour rates so we know what you're asking for that to go up. Is that what you're saying? Well, it, it does. It does. Because when, th when you throw it uh, into the big pile, you don't yeah. see what that kilowatt hour. Yeah, it does. It does. It does equate to uh, ultimately in a kilowatt hour rate that changes on a almost a monthly basis. And yes, we do break that out. OK, and then one final. Now, one. Sir, just, if, if you could, we've got a long line and I want to reserve plenty of time. I was just getting a clarification on his answer. Okay. Let's okay? be very quick and let's get a very clarification quick on the answer for the spirit thing was the rates are too high here compared to everybody else. So that's why you lowered them. I think that was your answer. Uh, Kent Rowe, Wichita, Kansas. Uh, Kansas statute specifically prohibits power purchase agreements. But the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission 2222 ruling contravenes that. Could you explain why Kansas is different? I'm not sure I completely understand your conversation because we do have purchase power agreements um, to, to serve customers. Yeah, but as rate payers, we have the right to defer capacity in uh, our own rate structures. Therefore, we can contract with someone else in the community, our neighbor, businesses, like they're doing everywhere else in the States. Uh, can you comment on that? 
Yeah. So I, I think what you're you're essentially talking about, and I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I, I think what you're essentially talking about is purchase power contracts that a, a business or a residential or a commercial customer could enter in with somebody else um, to receive their generation from, from somebody else. Is that, is that correct? Not necessarily generation, but just to go uh, off grid during those peak times or times when you need it uh, to be uh, more resilient. Okay. Well, well, essentially what that is, is a form of deregulation and there are 10 deregulated states in the United States and 40 that aren't essentially uh, one that is kind of a weird duck in, in Nebraska, <laughs> but, uh, but, and so if, if this were a deregulated state, that is something that, that customers could do as it is not, that is, that's not something that is, is allowed here. All right. I'll be speaking on that later if I have a chance. Thank you. Sure. And we're going to take a, a zoom, uh, question right now, and then we'll go back to the, the people in Wichita. Um, Ian um, Wolgath, um, Wol Wolgameth, I'm sorry about bungling that. Mr. Wolgameth? Mr. Wolgameth, you're muted if you're still with us. Okay, well, we will go. Uh, we'll we'll go back to live questions. So, thank you for your patience. Melanie Ann Greenwood from Wichita, Kansas. Miss Carly, I have a question. You said something about nine point something percent and moving it up to ten point two for the shareholders. Correct. The rate of I don't know that my uh, presentation covered, I, I believe what you're referencing is is the rate of return perhaps. And I think that was an Evergy's presentation. Or, or it could have been curves as well. well I think it, I think actually, it, was, it was curves, I think. It was oh. curves. Yes. What, how, what, what's your question? I'm sorry. I, I thought I heard, actually it was Carly that I'm sure said it, but someone said the shareholders rate was nine point something and you were going to raise it to 10.2. It. I'm not sure who said it, but I, in my remarks, I referenced that Evergy is asking for a rate of return on common equity for their shareholders at 10.25%, at but currently that rate of return is 9.3. So that issue is being determined in this particular rate case. And, um, Evergy has, has presented its evidence on that. Curb will present its evidence. KCC staff will present its evidence. And ultimately, the commission will decide what the proper rate of return for shareholders should be. And will that increased rate of return be part of the 14 some dollars a month? The, the rate of return on common equity is part of the weighted average cost of capital, which uh, is helps finance the 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 capital investment that Evergy makes, so it will be part of the fourteen point two four or whatever rate increase, if at all, the commission grants. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Bill Wentz. I'm a native of Wichita, eighty nine and counting. I've been a West uh, Evergy customer all the time. We live in, in an area where I have all electric home, all electric car. Uh, we've signed on for the excess solar that, that Westar provides and pay a premium for that. The world had 3 billion people in 1950. It had 6 billion in 2000. It's headed toward 9 billion people. We cannot keep burning fossil fuels. Now we're talking about the economics of an expansion. A new battery plant is coming to Kansas. That's that's great. We need those for electric cars. My concern is... A, a reminder, this is for questions, not, yes. not comments. So if you could please get to your question. Sure. The question is, the, the rate increase, uh, to the, the cost of that new plant is it, it was presented here. That will become from the keep the uh, sources of the investors, not the the ratepayers. Is that correct? Because what I heard just a few minutes ago was that uh, expansion came at the expense of 
investors. And so my question is, is that correct? Or, or is it going to come at the expense of some rate increases? So uh, great question. Thank you. Um, a couple of things uh, with respect to Panasonic. So first of all, uh, the only thing that is in this rate case with respect to Panasonic is a request that the commission look at granting an abbreviated case sometime after this to bring in to rates any investment made to serve Panasonic and the surrounding areas. And there's, there's, there's some other things in that as well. So it's not just Panasonic. There, there are other things that we're looking at. Um, with respect to who pays uh, for the utility service, the electric service that goes out to uh, Panasonic, anything that is used exclusively exclusively to serve their plant, meaning it's, it, it takes it into their building and it, it's, it's, they, they need it to run their plant. They pay for that. When we extend a transmission line out there, when we build a substation that will both serve them as well as other customers and the surrounding communities as it grows, that is a cost that is um, put into rates and that all customers pay for. But it's like any, any other customer. If you build a home, the line that comes out to your subdivision is something that is a cost that everybody pays for. If you put up a bakery in town, same thing. Um, and anytime that there's an existing part of the system that a new business comes in and we have to invest more and expand it and increase the capacity there, again, same thing. That is a cost for that, that everybody pays for as part of electric rates. Now, having said that, Panasonic is a little bit different. When we at our homes use electricity, it's very, very much uh, hour by hour can, can change uh, dramatically. For people that work and don't have folks at home, you use very little electricity during the day. A lot of your electricity gets used between when you get home and when you go to bed. So there's ups and downs, peaks and valleys in that usage. When Panasonic comes on, they're going to be running 24 hours a day, three shifts, and it's going to be a huge user, which means that all of those kilowatt hours they consume, all that load growth is actually going to exceed the investment that has to be made to serve them and should put downward pressure on rates over the, the period of their uh, existence. Okay. Um so we're, we're going to take questions from all the people currently in line, and then we're going to take a break and bring the commissioners in just so we have adequate time. Um, sure. Thank that. you. My Go name ahead. is David Griffiths. I represent a number of uh, network of churches, and I'm hoping you will tell me that my information is incorrect. Okay. But it's my understanding that uh, there's a possible rate increase for churches, and I don't know if that includes all 501c3s but like somewhere between 20 and 25%. So if you can speak into that and let me know if that's accurate, number one, and why that would be accurate if it is. Okay, so I'm going to... I'm going to answer your question backwards. I'm going to talk about the why, and then I'm going to talk about the what, and then I'm going to ask to follow up. So a uh, couple things. Uh, if you recall the slide with the boxes on there where I talked about how rates are made, and I said it's operational cost plus investment divided by usage, and then you get a rate. Well, that's true at a very high level, but underneath that, you have different classes of customers. So you, there, there are three major classes, industrial class, that's a spirit, uh, commercial, that would be Coke down the street here, um, and then residential, which is the bulk of, of the folks who are here this evening. And those rate structures, the design for those rates are all somewhat different, and meaning that the commission will actually look and say, of this rate increase, you know, where should this, where is this most fairly uh, allocated? And so the overall rate increase could be one thing, but different classes of customers sometimes get a little more or a little less, depending on essentially all of the stakeholders and, and the company um, working on it together, and then ultimately the commission makes a decision. Um, frequently, um, the company will will ask to um, just have all classes be the same. Other times where different costs of service, meaning it's more expensive to serve different kinds of customers or less expensive, we'll, we'll make tweaks to that. In this particular case, I know a lot of people have been talking about, I've heard two things really, schools, and churches getting a significantly higher 25% plus increase. 
I do not believe that's accurate. I don't believe that's anywhere near close to, to what it may be. It may be that some categories of churches um, are a little bit more than that 9.7% uh, that we discussed earlier. What I would like to do is I would like in the break, if we could talk, get your information, and then we can tell you what class, you know, we can have some dialogue with you. We can tell you what class of service your church is, the other churches you're here to speak on behalf of, and we can help sort through what the real information is for you. There are tons of different classes of customers. And so everybody's, everybody's you know, impact is going to be a little bit different within the resident, not the residential, the commercial and industrial space. And so we'll, I just, I want to make sure we get you the most accurate. Okay, so is it somewhere around 20%? And then I, I don't, hear, I don't okay. believe so. I, and if I, I understood you, you're just going to be able to answer us church by church is I what I thought able, I heard you Yeah, say. we'll be able to tell you what, what account, what rate you're on and what, this case as it sits right now, not necessarily what will happen, but what is proposed, what that would look like. And I'd okay. be happy to do that. Thank you. Yep. All right. We're going to take a Zoom call right now. Uh, Ty Gorman, Mr. Gorman. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, you referenced the uh, high prices and volatility of uh, coal and gas earlier, and uh, renewable energy prices have been low for some time, but being lower than fossil fuels for many years, but the Inflation Reduction Act uh, has recently provided a lot of opportunities, not only for the utility, but for customers to reduce uh, bills. And I was uh, hoping the right person there could um, tell us uh, what is being done to facilitate savings from those federal funds to lower the bills for Kansas Central customers. Uh, Ty, is that to me? Yeah, I. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I can tell you that we've got a task force uh, at Evergy looking at this. I mean, any dollars we can access uh, that would um, help, whether it is buy down the cost of renewables, whether it is programs that we could partner with the state or federal government to help on, uh, those are all things that we're interested in. Um, there's not a lot of definite uh, yet from the federal government on this, but we are we are working through it. And, um, you know, we've also had a lot of good collaboration uh, with the KCC, KCC staff and other interested parties who are are interested in leveraging those dollars. Thank you. We're, we're back to live question or questions in person, I guess. So. Well, thanks. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to answer these questions. My name is Brendan Whipple. I actually serve the city as our mayor. And uh, frankly, I want to start off by saying uh, this is going to hurt us economically when it comes to being competitive with other areas of the state, including Kansas City. Uh, it's going to hurt us when it comes to attracting jobs. And more importantly, it's going to hurt our citizens. Uh, we have elderly folks uh, who are living. I'm getting to my question. Okay, please do. We We've have got elderly we have folks. people Excuse me. behind Excuse you. Me. No, 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 no. I, I want to get all of your constituents an opportunity to ask a question. So if you let me finish, I can comment. ask my question. Well, please get to it. We have elderly folks who we want to keep on our house and we're trying to cut their costs and $200 makes them a year makes them wonder if they could turn their air conditioning on when it's 104 degrees outside and our people have to go help those people when they can't afford to turn air conditioning on and they have to have uh, medical attention. Now my ask for you all is I looked at your proposal and it's not just infrastructure it's also benefits for executives such as increased uh, health insurance or increased life insurance and what I want to know is when I looked at your stock over the last five years, you had an increase of over 7% in your stock over the last five years. Over the last five years, everyone in this room felt the repercussions of the pandemic. Why should we pay for your executive benefits? That's my question. So, Mr. Mayor, first of all, thank you for coming tonight. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank um, you for being here. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, appreciate your question. So uh, I may, on the details of this, I may uh, defer to my colleague here, but but the lion's share of executive compensation and particularly compensation that's based on share price performance, stock price performance, things like that, that's stuff that is not part of this rate case. It's not part of things that are compensated for by customers. Well, according to the reporting on it, it said life insurance is 
the media and the report that they cited wrong? Are, or are you telling us now that that well that that actually isn't true? You're not asking for more life yeah. insurance for your executives. So I think I yeah. So I think what you're talking about, uh, if you if you recall in my presentation, I referenced a a rate credit that was going away as part of this rate increase uh, request. That is actually for what's called corporate owned life insurance or COLI. And it was actually established around 40 years ago. And what that was is when we were bringing the Wolf Creek nuclear power plant online, that was a huge investment, multi-billion dollar investment, significant for Westar at the time and KCPNL. One of the things that Westar did, and it was they were not unique in doing this, there were several other utilities that did things very similar to this, is they took out life insurance, not just on executives, but on several hundred um, employees. And essentially what happened is as the premiums, uh, the premiums for that were put into rates, right? But all the benefits were taken out as a credit and it actually reduced how much went into rates from Wolf Creek. Well, that program has run 40 years now and we're just seeking to, to wrap it up. So there'd be no more premium payments, but then also um, the benefits don't get paid back as part of a credit to um, rates. So why do we pay more for that? Why is that part of your proposal then? Well, I mean, is, that, that, I'm, it, I'm asking it, the justification of that. Yeah, right. yeah so this is Darren. How do I talk to people that I represent at the local level and tell them, no, you're actually paying for this other insurance thing that happened 40 years ago? How do I explain that? It is, so, so again, it's a little confusing, but but what's happened is there's been benefits for customers over the last 40 years because Westar put that in place and, and that it was contractually set to, to expire. So, so those credits or those benefits, those lower rates that customers have paid are going away. So you're not paying more for anything new. You're, you're losing a credit that ran its course contractually Be that got set up for so you. So we're not paying more, we're just losing a discount that we had. That is correct. That, and it's the most it, peak thing I've ever heard. Well, it, it, it may be, but but it's true. And so so think of it this way. So there's the, those life insurance proceeds have paid over $800 million back to customers, whereas the premiums to generate those have been less. And as a result, there has been less in rates all this time. <laughs> okay, thank you for being here. Apologies. My name is Jackie Eckert. I live in Hutchinson, which is in Reno County. Um, just a little comment to a gentleman that asked you about spirit. Um, it might have something to do with you lo lowering the rates because both of your um, shareholders, Vanguard and BlackRock, are. Um, to the top two for spirit and the top in the top three for you two. So that might have a little impact on why you lowered the rates. And my question is, um, you stated there was no re rate increases in the last five years. I want you to explain to us, how did our energy costs double or triple two years ago when they had that ice storm in Texas? And then I also want you to explain to me how much did the KCC award Evergy in damages? Okay, well, we didn't get anything in damages, so we can we can start there. Um, let me, I want to go back to the, the Vanguard comment. Just, just so everybody is aware, Vanguard, BlackRock, they do own substantial positions um, in uh, Spirit, and they also, uh, Vanguard for sure, owns uh, a substantial position in us. That was the case, though, prior to the merger. It hasn't really changed, and it was for both legacy companies. And so at the time when Westar declined to offer an economic development rate, um, those shareholders would have been substantially similar at that time. So, and, and we don't consult shareholders at all about rate setting, things like that. If there was somebody from BlackRock or Vanguard in here, I, I wouldn't recognize them. With respect to Winter Storm Uri, if you will recall my presentation, I said there are some, and I think in a subsequent follow-up, there are things that aren't part of base rates, charges that go up and go down. And one of those is fuel. And when fuel, the price of natural gas skyrocketed and the, and the price of power skyrocketed 
in winter storm Uri. Not just because Texas had an ice storm, but because 25 states all at the same time were in sub-zero temperatures and there was not enough natural gas supply to meet demand to heat and electrify homes. And so as a result, that also impacted us and every other utility. Now, in this area, uh, Evergy Kansas Central, you're a little bit more reliant on natural gas than, for example, Evergy Kansas Metro, which is a little more reliant on coal. And that's where that differential comes from. But didn't we sell energy to Texas? Uh, I'm just... We use that. What is it, the Southwest Power Pool that we belong we, to? We we sell that power. Kansas don't have any control over. Correct. We we do sell power our power into the Southwest Power Pool, and we draw our power from right. The and it's not power Kansans' pool. fault that their turbines and their solar panels didn't work in Texas. I, I want to be sure that we get time for everybody to ask questions, and that we don't cut into. Uh, but you know, I'm I'm hitting a sore subject. So I don't I care. I'm off. I'm neutral. I could care. Ask away. I just we're. I don't want to, I just want to let everybody know, I don't want to cut into time where you have the commissioner's attention, but please. Okay. Okay. That's fine. Thank you. Please, uh, Mr. Kaisley, I, I re-ask your question. Well, I just want to know why we sell energy to other states when we, and, and then it costs us money for those transportation lines that you want to charge us for to send it. And you take our land from us, you take, you use the power lines and we have to pay for those power lines. And we make enough energy in this state to supply our own customers, but yet you want to send it somewhere else. And we pay for it. Why? It, so, so I'll take a cut at that. And it's, it, it, it's, it's a good question. Um, with the Southwest Power Pool, it, it serves and, and pretty much every region of the country has a, a similar structure and it it came down from some actions of the, the federal regulatory bodies that set these up. And they are intended and they they do provide benefits overall to the region that they serve because they're able to meet the needs of the region when there are pluses and minuses. In the case of the Uri storm, we did in the central service territory incur more costs as a result of that storm than we made as a result of selling power. So when we did sell power, we got the higher prices for selling the power that the market was charging. We just needed to use more natural gas and use more power during the storm to serve customers in the area. Then, then we got money. That's why there was a charge in the central area. So if we needed to use more natural gas to serve Kansas customers in that time, why did we sell power somewhere else at that time? So I think I think you've hit on something that is a very important policy uh, question. And as, as Darren said, you know, stemming all the way back to the early 2000s, the federal government made the decision that putting together regional transmission organizations or something like the Southwest Power Pool across the United States would be beneficial for two reasons. One, um, they're supposed to be more reliable, less, less subject to some of the outages, for example, the one that happened on the East Coast around that time. Um, but the second is, if we are making power here and we are and distributing power here and it's all just ours, then the cost for that is based entirely on our plants. So we may have a plant here um, that costs us a certain amount of money to run, but Maybe in Iowa or in Missouri, there's one that's 15% cheaper. Well, on most days, what happens through the Southwest Power Pool is we would draw from that cheaper power and give everybody here the benefit of that cheaper power. Um, but the, the flip side for that is that you have to have transmission to move it around within this regional transmission organization. And the second thing is that there are some times where we have lost the complete autonomy that we had five or six years ago, um, where it was power, power made here, delivered here, and we're in a little bit of an, you know, we'd be a little bit of an island. A lot of what happened to Texas is because they were, they were an island and, and too self-reliant and not, and, and did not have enough electricity to meet their 
um, indigenous demand there. Because they went to turbines and solar, which is a ridiculous thing. We need to stay with our fuels and our coal that we have here and our nuclear power plant that's only running at 34% right now. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Jerry Charlton, professional engineer from Overland Park, wasn't able to attend the one two, two weeks ago, so I drove down here this, eight, this evening. So to comment on prior question, you know, I think the easy thing to approach here is consider selling power to another grid as standby power. That's the most punitive or increased tariff that that Evergy has. So sell that power as standby power and then use those revenues to offset uh, potential rate increases. My question is about the um, Panasonic uh, battery plant. And we touched on it earlier about uh, power purchase agreement. And uh, I believe you indicated that, that Panasonic is gonna be uh, developing and paying for their own utility costs. Is that correct? So the parts of the system that serve just them that that they will pay for extending the service out there and the capacity that's going to be needed for all of the development around there that is going to be a cost that is distributed uh, across all customers okay so i think a combined goal for evergy and your consumers is introducing efficiency stewardship of the consumer's pocketbooks and stewardship of our environment with that being said energy efficiency is something that's lacking in our grid today and if we develop combined heat and power on site, just distribute generation of power, which is what Panasonic should do. The question is can we privatize the, uh, the utility at, at Panasonic versus um, you know, build out from Evergy into that facility? Because we could, we could get 80% efficient uh, combined heat and power projects at, at uh, at Panasonic, that would double the efficiency that we see from, from the Evergy grid. And by privatizing it, I estimate the um, uh, Kansas City Star article mentioned that it's going to be a demand of 250 megawatts, which is twice that of Evergy's current largest customer. That's going to cost north of $300 million. If we privatize, if we allow that to be privatized, that entity can can build that out with a return on investment in less than five years at no cost to your consumers. If we fund that $300 million plus, that's on our consumers back and it's gonna be a 20 year return on investment by Evergy. So can we consider with the Kansas Corporation Commission allowing Panasonic to privatize their grid? So I think, I think that there's a lot there and because we've got a lot of people behind you. I'm going to try and be as brief as possible. Um, and I'd be happy to talk to you in a break or afterwards too about this. So a couple things, you know, we don't, there's no prohibition at all about Panasonic uh, supplying through combined heat and power or otherwise a substantial part of the generation to serve them uh, should they want to do that. They wanted to locate here. They did not. Um, that's not something that they want to do. Um, and we are obligated to extend service to a customer if they choose to locate here. Mm -hmm. um, much the same way I should add is Spirit. So Spirit is a very large customer, not 250 megawatts, but a very large customer. And that putting that facility here was a socialized cost, extending it to Coke down the street, Textron, um, you know, all of those is a cost that is spread uh, across everybody, but they're such high volume users they actually benefit the system. They're actually going to put downward pressure on rates. If Panasonic is interested in, in putting up their own solar, doing combined heat and power, and that and they believe that that would financially pencil out for them, that is absolutely something we would be willing to, to look at and to collaborate on. I will tell you that a lot of folks look at that, and then they look at the price uh, of electricity delivered um, from us, and it just it doesn't pencil out quite as easily as, as, it, as you indicated. Now, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't have enough information to specifically tell you if they've, they've looked at that or not, but it's something we would absolutely consider. 
The final thing I'd say is I, I'm not sure where you're getting your $300 million from. I don't believe I've seen anything that, uh, that approaches that right now. And I don't think ultimately it's probably going to be 250 megawatts in this installment either. Um, that's, that, that is a, you know, I know the star reported it. That's, I think that's the maximum it would right. probably be. I expect it will probably be less. And I expect that we'll know a lot more when they start really turning dirt out there and, and putting up buildings and they know a little yeah. bit more about what they're going to look like. The $300 million. If, if we could give the people behind you an opportunity to, to, to ask some questions, sir, I, you've had a lot of time at the mic. You know, just real quick, the $300 million came from a, a natural gas combined uh, gotcha. cycle faci uh, facility is about 500,000 per megawatt. If we turn that into combined heat and power, the back end equipment is going to cost some more. So I'm, I think you got to double that at least. So that's where I came up with the 300 million. Gotcha. Thank you. Hi, I'm Janelle Davey. I have a question. How much is gained from wind and solar power? Well, I would. Can you can you help me out there and be a little more specific? I don't know what for you mean Kansas, by gain for Kansas. How much is gained financially by wind and solar? From the developers, or I, I'm not Just, following you. Oh, all right. So, um, you the the corporation gains money or energy or something from wind and solar, correct? Uh, in some cases, yes. Okay. How much? Well, I don't know off the top of my head. I can tell you that we've got around 4,000 megawatts of, of wind, um, not a ton of solar, but about 4,000 megawatts of wind. Easily half of that, maybe more, is through what are called purchase power agreements, um, which means those, those costs are passed through at $1 to $1, and the, the corporation makes nothing off of that. We do have some uh, that are investments uh, that we, we own and we operate. And those would be subject to recovering, um, you know, recovering their cost and then earning a return on that. I, Darren, do you know off the top of your head, we, we might have to give you an answer. Uh, we might have to look it up because it's, I mean, we've got a whole bunch of wind farms and, and a significant portion are purchase power agreements. Okay. Why is it all being farmed out outside of Kansas? It's all being sent out. No. It's, None of us are not benefiting from it. That's, that's absolutely not true almost all of it stays here what percentage well it depends on it depends on how the market's going on any given day so the percentage right now is going to be different than the percentage is 15 minutes from now again that's part of this regional transmission organization which which manages the grid for a 17 state region um so you're sending out to 17 states no it almost all of it stays right here and what percentage it 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 actually varies varies by hour, but but it is substantially high percentage that stays in in our region. Thank you. Good question. Hello, my name's Virginia Maka. I'm from Iola, Kansas, that great place of Allen County where the Blackberry Wolf Creek line is now taking eminent domain among 57 landowners besides that. <clears throat> so this is how I got into this, uh, uh, probably learning about utilities because it's a very complex, nasty, confusing, game-playing field. And so here's my question. Open access transmission tariffs. How many of those do you expect to collect on these transmission lines to charge back to uh, rate holders in these areas and of the cost that you're going to put back on rate holders in Kansas, how much of that energy is transferred out on the open market through the open marketplace in the Southwest Power Pool that will not benefit our state? Because we found out in the Wolf Creek that we will pay 16.8% of that construction cost for that transmission line that serves no one in Southeast Kansas. And we will lose our land to eminent domain. So how much of that cost, how much of that energy is transferred outside the state and how much of that cost for construction goes with it or does it all go back on local rate holders? Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to take a couple of uh, your questions and then I'm going to let uh, Darren talk uh, a little bit too. So, so first of all, I want to be real clear. That's not our line. 
<laughs> it, Correct, it, but you have Wolf Creek, yeah, and you sure. were involved in this. For, for sure, we we would have liked to have built that line, but the decision was made to give it to another corporation from outside of the state. Um, and so I have a lot of empathy with what you're going through in terms of the land acquisition process and how folks are being treated. I've heard a lot about it. Um, I just wanted to make very clear that's not us. Um, the the second thing, but you do have the eminent domain power. Oh yes, correct. absolutely. Um, the we don't use it very much though, um, and probably nowhere near what what it's going to ultimately be used on this line is my suspicion. However, however, having said all of that, um, I, I want to point out one essential thing uh, about Wolf Creek and about how the the system works. It's really not as simple as saying, does the electricity stay here? Does it go somewhere else? And let's just let's just use Wolf Creek as, a, as an example. Wolf Creek is 46% owned by the company that used to be ever, uh, Westar and 46% owned by the company that used to be KCPNL. Well, KCPNL has Missouri customers. So portion a portion of Wolf Creek has and always has before the Southwest Power Pool, since the very creation of Wolf Creek, flown or, or, or flowed out of state to uh, Missourians because they're paying for that that part of the plant. They're paying for that capacity. Now, the reason, one of the reasons that this line is being built, there's a couple. One is to make sure that it's as resilient and reliable as possible, but also there is beginning to be a lot of congestion put on the electrical grid in Kansas. And what happens is sometimes we actually have to reduce the power coming out of Wolf Creek, which nobody wants, um, in order to accommodate that congestion. And so this additional line will help. It's essentially like building another lane on an interstate. It'll help more cars, more electricity go to and from. Um, so, and that will absolutely help and benefit um, the customers here tonight and in Evergy Kansas Central because it'll help keep, make sure that this very low cost asset now is online and delivering as much power as it possibly can. You know, it sounds really good, but when you talk about this delivering cost reductions to customers, we don't see that on our bills. In fact, we see just the opposite. And so we talk about levelization and this economic development, but when you talk about the Southwest Power Pool, which I don't really understand your relationship with the Southwest Power Pool, but here's what I do see. I see the Southwest Power Pool isn't 17 states. The Southwest Power Pool is North America. And it also includes Canada because Canada is part of the Southwest Power Pool. And so when you look at Kansas, a net energy state, a net energy state, we send wind energy out of this state every day of the week. I'm just wondering how much of this cost that goes to the East Coast or West Coast that has bad policy in energy to reduce their cost, which we call levelization. Um, <clears throat> We'll come back on these hardworking people of Kansas. And we every day have to face recession. We have to face re inflation, high food cost, energy increasing, and now a reappraisal of our land. A reappraisal of our land. And some people can't pay their taxes on their land. And so I'm wondering why you would ask for a rate increase when there are such things as uh, say, abandonment plant incentives from FERC, which your compadre next era uses, the CWIP incentives, which says the federal government will make you whole on building these transmission lines. There, are we leveraging our federal ability in getting these kind of subsidies so you won't have to put cost increase on good, hardworking Kansans? Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dennis Hedke. I'm here in Wichita. I'll be very brief, uh, I hope. Um, and some of the facts and figures I'll share with you are going to relate to a question at the end. So uh, since 2012, according to Curb, represented at the table, here are some quick financial facts. 
that relate to our customers here, Central, Evergy Central. Um, in 2012, for an average 900 kilowatt installation, uh, the average monthly charge was $95.76. In 2022, it went up to 128.77 or about a 34% increase. Transmission charge, which is my focus uh, in 2012, was on the bill $9.08. Now the bill is $17.29. That's a 90% increase in cost related to transmission costs. Well, that's just a fact. I'm just, you know, uh, don't don't clap. You know, I'm just I want to share more facts with you. But in uh, in the Kansas Electric Grid mix, uh, what we have in 12. Uh, from coming from wind was 2713 megawatts in 2022 3895 megawatts that's uh 47.13 percent of the total that we have coal 5473 megawatts uh in 2012 and in 2022 it went down to 2668 megawatts decrease of 49 percent increase of 43 percent wind on that first line are, are we close to your question? Yes, you are. Okay, very thanks. close. Very close. Uh, nuclear, we had in 2012 1,185 megawatts, and now we have 1,185, about the same capacity, or about 14.3%. Um, the US EIA tells us in 2021, electricity production capacity in Kansas was 18,432 megawatts. And electric consumption in Kansas was 10,945. So there's a lot of power created that doesn't stay in Kansas, goes somewhere and gets used, as has been pointed out by some other folks here. So, uh, and there's on the books right now, as I understand it, 428 megawatts of additional uh, energy on the books to be added to the grid where we're only using less than 70% of what we already produce. So my question to Evergy is if we're exporting maybe as much as 7,500 megawatts uh, in the current system, uh, according to the EIA, what actual benefit are you bringing to Kansas ratepayers with all that export activity? And finally, does Evergy, please answer this question, have transmission applications on file with the Southwest Power Pool uh, with respect to that 428 megawatts? Uh, and if so, how much and where? So, so, so let me ask a question. So I wanna make sure I understand the last one. Okay. The, the 428 megawatts, can you go through what you're looking for there from a, a transmission request standpoint. I want to make sure I I understand that question. Well, I, I guess I'm just asking in the Evergy case or in your inside your organization, how much of that form some odd megawatts is in your purview and what kind of rate applications with Salus Power Pool do you have in play to move that power out of Kansas? So, so, so I, I, you'll have to apologize. I, you, I, I tried writing it down, and then it just okay. there was a lot of data thrown, and I'm not quite sure where it all where it all came from. Some of it sounds like EIA, some of it sounds like Curb, and I'll be honest, that I'm not sure all that matches up. A couple things. One, as a general principle, Evergy Kansas Central has we we are required to have enough generation uh, to meet our obligation to serve customers plus a little bit of cushion. And as a general rule, that's about where we are. We have had significant excess generation in the past. Um, if you go back five, six years, uh, several hundred megawatts of generation 
um, that we could sell into the market and that would be credited back to customers. That's not really the case anymore. And that's why you'll see in our integrated resource plan that we're starting to look at adding not just additional renewable resources, but in our most recent update, we've started to talk about adding another combined cycle natural gas plant because with the economic growth that the state is experiencing, and with the way the Southwest Power Pool accredits uh, renewable energy in particular, which they're reducing how much credit they give utilities for, we're now very tight on capacity. So as a general rule, we don't move a bunch of electricity out of state. The electricity we make stays here and it serves Kansas customers. Now, there are times when somebody else needs it and it might be a little closer that we send it there and we can get a good price for it but then we also get you know we might buy from somebody else at a reduced price and that financial arbitrage is something that has paid net benefits to Evergy Kansas Central customers and our other customers uh, over the time time period that we have been participating in the Southwest Power Pool market which Good, bad, or indifferent is something that we essentially have to we have to um, operate in that environment. It's not a choice. Yeah, and I just I just want to add one thing there. Chuck said it, but but if we sell more energy into the Southwest Power Pool than our customers use, the mo- that differential and that money from the sales goes directly back to customers through that fuel clause that's on your bill that Chuck talked about earlier that is there's there's no corporate profit in that it's just the dollars in and the dollars out sorry in the fuel market and and the same is true if we have capacity that 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 folks can use so so those are all accounted for and they're tracked they come back to customers and it's part of the review process that that ultimately the the KCC looks at in that process and if and if we have capacity to sell, we we do our very best to sell it and and bring those dollars back for Kansas and Missouri customers. Thank you for your responses. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I have a quick, easy question here for you. I think um, mine has to do with uh, paying quarterly dividends, and so I'm just going to say this, or and it's it is a question, but uh, Jim Carr from Andover. Uh, many companies have foregone or quit paying dividends to their shareholders. And what I wonder is, would Evergy consider reducing their dividend or not paying a dividend? And how much of our rate kind of goes into that? Because that has to do with profit margins and things like that. But so my question is, would you consider that to help us, you know, with our rates or with your rate increase. And that's all I'm just going to ask my question and go sit in. Thank you. Well, appreciate the brief question and, okay. and, and appreciate a very straightforward question. And uh, so I'll tell you a couple things. One, um, Evergy being the combined company, I don't think in its history has, has uh, eliminated or reduced its um, dividend. And so I will, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, predecessor company, KCPNL, Great Plains Energy was actually the, the, the company that traded on the stock exchange. They did um, at one point, essentially um, in the recession, uh, 2007, 2008. Um, and it was uh, to make sure that we, we maintained our credit metrics and, and remained uh, you know, financially solvent. It's the single biggest day that that stock experienced uh, the single biggest decline in a day that that stock ever saw. And the reason for that is shareholders, by and large, of utilities do not expect to have their share price appreciate the way other places do uh, in the market. They expect very slow, very uh, incremental um, appreciation in the valuation of their share price. The reason you invest in a utility stock almost exclusively is to is to achieve that dividend. And so if you eliminate the dividend, then what you're going to do is you are going to take an entire class of folks that would invest in this and they, they would just simply take their money out of Kansas and they, they wouldn't fund the capital investments anymore. And it would hurt 17,000 plus retail uh, shareholders um, in Kansas, not to mention 
all of the different public employee funds that are invested in utility stocks because they're viewed largely, uh, very much like, um, you know, we trade inversely with the bond market because we're considered a very safe, very steady, nobody's going to get rich, but but you're, you, you get to have a, a slow, steady return and appreciation and a dependable dividend. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hi, Beverly Cook, Wichita, Kansas. I have a quick question. Uh, I would like to know how the uh, ending of the corporate-owned life insurance program is going to affect retirees. It's not. It's not? It's not. And, and that's because they never got, those retirees never saw uh, a, the, the, the payout from uh, a death. That got paid back and, and acted as a, as a credit for rates. So it was taken out on them, but it, 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 it on as life insurance for them, but it was paid back um, to reduce the cost of Wolf Creek when it came on on the market. So that was not something they expected. Um, it was not something it was a, it was it was essentially a financial mechanism to reduce the impact of Wolf Creek. OK, so the insurance that we have is still valid and good. Yes. That's all I need to know. Right. Thank you. You betcha. Thank you. We're going to take another Zoom question. Um, Emily Tallman. Hi, Emily Tallman. I'm in Topeka. Uh, I hope my question's pretty quick. Uh, in my line of work and in my community, uh, there's a lot of people that are struggling with paying for basic needs. And I know that Evergy has Project Deserve to help out with that. Um, so my question is, if this rate increase were to pass, will those income limits that are set or the benefit limit also be increasing? Because I'm just wondering how many more people would then have to rely on our state's low income energy assistance program. So great question. I um, We periodically evaluate the thresholds uh, for our utility assistance programs, but most of the time, um, anything that has access to state or federal funds, they're fairly prescriptive on what that could be. Now, we do advocate with the state uh, and, and sometimes uh, at the federal government to both change eligibility levels as well as uh, increase funding. The other thing that we do, uh, so for example, during COVID, we worked um, with the state of Kansas and, and had a lot, of, a lot of great partnership to extend the time limits, to extend the, the eligibility requirements. Um, we also have worked, um, you know, one of the things that many people don't know, but uh, these are first come first serve basis funds many times. So your relative efficiency in accessing them um, often determines how many people get access to them. And to that end, uh, we work with all of the community action organizations to train up their staff. In many cases, we have direct computer links uh, with them so they can, they can access and we can access uh, each other's systems. And then, of course, both in uh, Wichita now and in um, Kansas City, not yet in Topeka, but coming soon, hopefully, uh, we have what is called Connect Centers, which is a place where people can actually come in, sit down and work with a customer advocate to try and access not just these kinds of funds, any other programs we may have as a utility, uh, and then oftentimes help with other things like documentation they may need. I think we have three more people in line from my from what I can see. So we'll take three more questions. Hello, Danielle Johnson, um, Wichita, Kansas. Um, a number of transmission lines are being upgraded. We're seeing that in our city. Oftentimes we're hearing some um, residents state that they would like to see those lines buried. With the uh, increase in cost, would this be enough to cover the question of being able to bury those lines? And if not, where would we look to find what those costs would be associated with bearing lines? Because oftentimes we're told it would cost too much, but I wouldn't know where to look to see how much that would cost. Okay, so that's a great question. Um, and, and I'm gonna give you a two-part answer. One is um, everything in this rate case is for dollars spent. So there's nothing, so those transmission lines that are getting worked on right now, that's not part of this rate increase request um, because it, it, we have to have them in service uh, and and we have to, you know, in order to uh, put, to, in order to put something in a rate increase request, it has, we have to be able to, it, it has to be done. So this is all for investments made. Um, with respect to your question about burying them, 
you know, this is this is one of my favorite conversations to have with folks because generally people believe that um, burying transmission lines or even distribution lines that that solves all the problems. So, first is a matter of cost. It's anywhere, depending on where it is, between ten and twenty times the cost to bury a line um, that it would be to put it on a pole and to have it um, above ground. That's probably not the two biggest things, though. I mean, it, it, cost. I mean, it would definitely raise costs a lot higher than it is now by a factor of ten at a minimum for those particular investments. But probably more importantly is in many places, and particularly places like Wichita and in Kansas City, downtown Topeka, the ability to put them under, underground is, is virtually impossible. Why would that be? Well, because you've got sewer lines now and you've got fiber optic buried and you've got, you've got four or five different things, what we call um, essential infrastructures that are already in the right of way. And so either there's not room or if there is room to bury a transmission line at that high a voltage would take such a big excavation that you wouldn't you wouldn't want us doing it. We would be digging up your front yard, your backyard. It would be months. It would be very intrusive. And then the third thing is, um, I had somebody call me um, in a neighborhood uh, that had buried all the distribution lines in this last big storm that we had uh, several weeks back. And uh, they wanted to know why they were out of power. They said, because, you know, we buried all our lines. So this can't be trees. Well, the fact of the matter is that power to that neighborhood comes in on overhead transmission lines somewhere else. And those, those lines were impacted. And as a result, they were out. It didn't make any difference that their lines were buried. And I will also tell you this, if you bury your lines, then it's very difficult to spot when and if there's a problem. It's very hard to find it. And it means tearing up a lot of different places. So in general, we don't think it's a great solution, even if you could get past the issue of cost. Thank you. Thank you. Hi there, Chris Charlton, Hutchinson, Kansas. Got a call about an hour and a half ago from this guy right here. Happens to be my brother from Kansas City. So we're going to double tag team this. All right. Okay. I'm, I'm taking a different path, though. So my goal is to help me help you. I have, I sell electric trucks, so globally. So um, there's CARB certification in California, tw like 22 states are adopting car CARB certifications for electric vehicles moving forward. I don't know if this board or anything has anything to do with that, but how can I get the, if I could sell, get kind of, there's no rebates in Kansas. There's rebates all over the country. There's rebates for EPA to build, build school buses, pay for electric school bus, things like that. What can Kansas do? Because I could bring electric vehicles like FedEx, UPS, last mile delivery into the state of Kansas quicker than anybody else can and get you revenue to take to, to use that capacity that you know everybody's been talking about that's going to Texas or wherever. We could keep it in here in the state. What kind of rebates or things like that because electric vehicles are expensive. So what is there available from you guys or whoever to help fund that? So generally speaking, um, we uh, the, the, in Kansas, that's one of the things that do not exist uh, is rebates and or, or tax tax rebates or credits. That would probably take an act at a Kansas at a state level that would probably take uh, passing a law at the legislature from a um, from a utility perspective, I mean, we do work. Um, we're working right now with Amazon and FedEx both on uh, helping to electrify uh, their fleet. But it is it's more on the infrastructure build out and things like that. And then the final thing is we are looking at the uh, at um, some of the federal funds that have recently been made available. I mentioned a task force earlier that we have. We are looking at ways that we could potentially partner and bring some of those back. But a lot of the rules and a lot of the procedures haven't been written on that yet. So it's still kind of up in the air. Something we're very interested in doing, um, but at a state level, that would probably take uh, an, an act of, of the legislature. Okay. Um, there is a $45,000 IRS tax credit available right now for anybody to do that. Yep. The IRS is still writing the rules on that. So, yep. um, you, know, we, you know, we were working with corporate FedEx, Amazon's, UPS, Coca-Cola, all those companies to electrify our, you know, 
to use our vehicles. And we actually, it's called Re Automotive, R E E dot auto, based in Israel. Okay. And th th thank you. Uh, if, if, again, if there's a question, we have a couple people that I want to be sure they can ask questions behind you rather than uh, so. What? No, no, no. I'm trying to get to I, use I, our I, excess sure, sure. capacity. I, I, I understand if we could let the other people in line ask questions. Yeah, I'm trying to you not. I'm I'm trying to help sir. use the use the electric to bring them sir, money. Sir, th th thank you. If you could let the next questioner uh, ask their question, you asked a question. It was answered. And I was just responding to her question. Well, we'll we'll have a break in a couple minutes, and you guys can have whatever dialogue you want during the break but again if you could cede the microphone and let the next person that'd be appreciated by everybody thank you okay you're welcome i'm frank mccollum from uh eureka you know we keep talking about going to this plant's going to burn all this electricity where the electricity going to come from we haven't built a new plant in this state for 60 years and they're talking about how they're going to put more regulation on coal plants to so they won't put as much juice out. So I'm I'm curious. We're building all these electric lines and everything else. Where's the electricity going to come from? Because we haven't built a plant, like I said, in 60 years. So what are we going to do? Good. I'm going to have to have another rate increase build a new plant. You know, I've lived in Kansas my whole life, and I know exactly every plant been built in Kansas, and we haven't done nothing in 60 years. So my question is, where is this electricity going to come from? Well, we our approach to uh, generation is an all of the all of the above approach. We have built a substantial amount of wind over the last uh, um, ten years, and we also have a lot of purchase power agreements for wind plants that have been built in Kansas. But in addition to that, we have built coal plants in the last uh, in the last ten years. Uh, uh, where at? Uh, well, one's up at Iatan, just on the other side of uh, Leavenworth uh, on the Missouri side. But yeah, that, that's Missouri side, not Kansas side. Yeah, but it serves Kansas. And, <laughs> and within the last 60 years, we built Lacine and Jeffrey and several. I mean, there, there, there have been a few in the last uh, little Jeff bit. Jeffrey's been built in the 70s. Uh, yeah. And the, the thing was built back in the, in the, in the, in the early I was 80s. built in the 70s too, and I'm not quite yet 60. Yeah, but the, the, the thing was built in the early 80s, you know, so we haven't built nothing in, in the last 40 years. Yeah, look, that's that's why our integrated resource plan has uh, is is has is calling for combined cycle natural gas. Call for what? Uh, a, a natural gas plant to make to make electricity. Okay, and all the things you talk about that Emmett domain, you guys are pretty good using that stuff. You you used it on me this winter, so I know about that. That's all I gotta say. Okay, we've got we've got our last questioner, and then we'll we'll take a break. Robin Smith, Wichita, and um, Evergy is not a choice for us. It's what we're given, what we have to use. So why is Evergy spending what appears to be so much money on television ads when we know you exist and you can put everything that's on that ad either in my paper bill or a computer bill? And I know television ads are very expensive. Thank you. Great question. Appreciate you bringing it up. So uh, we do want our customers to know um, the different ways. That the, I think the particular ads you're talking about right now are talking about different ways you can get uh, outage uh, notifications and different ways you can get your uh, get your bill or different rates and things like that. Uh, we do use bill inserts and we do use emails and things of that nature. The good news is that a substantial amount um, and sometimes all of what we put on TV uh, doesn't actually get ultimately included in rates, but that's a shareholder expense. If it's purely if it's purely for brand or for image, um, like you said, we're a monopoly, you know we're here, then that's not something that comes out of rates. If it's something that's educational or helps customers access um, a, a product or a service, that we offer or a different way to, you know, knowledge about something like that, then that is something we can ask for recovery for. Sometimes we get it, sometimes we do not. Okay, this is the last question. It's more or less of a comment. Well, we, then, uh, then it's over and you'll have no, a comment to make. I, I sit here, waited on you please, guys. Please turn off his no, mic. If he, that doesn't make ask, a difference, I'll, I'll just can ask talk a question in front of the commissioners. We're, we're going to go on break then. All right, go ahead. and You... 
the country is, is in an economical crash and it's all because of corporate America. OK, so this all this thing all started with Joe Biden and it, it was fine. It was fine with it was fine with Trump. Everything was fine until corporate America stepped in and got Joe Biden in there. Now we got this battery thing going on. You we got Panas Panasonic coming in. And so you want to raise my my electricity to pay for Panasonic? Does anybody realize here that the Wichita has been paying the electric bill, half the electric bill for Boeing for years? And now Panasonic comes in, you want to raise this and you come up with some excuses for, for this raise? It's all about Panasonic and these stinking batteries. If, if, if corporate America wouldn't have let this we wouldn't let this pipeline into China in 73 with Nixon, we wouldn't have this problem. We'd already have the batteries going. But corporate America wanted to make money, put money in their pockets, and take it out of ours and put it in their pockets. That's my comment. Thank you for giving me the time. Thank you to everyone who's participated in the question and answer session. We'll pause for a moment, let the commissioners rejoin us, and begin with part two. Thank you. Yeah, well, I got a little bit of background here. I just don't know. I appreciate that very much. Church question. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I saw that Michelle mentioned the same thing, but I don't see them on my. My thing was looking through the whole time. I was communicating with Michelle about that. So, um, uh, maybe it was down a little bit. And I just didn't like this. Okay, so I stopped. No. No, I was a little nervous to go out there. I was not nervous, but you know what I'm saying. Like, uh, I don't want to like, sit back and run into someone. Like, what? Oh, yeah. very It was very bad. And they were just surrounded, surrounding us, almost like we might have seen over kind of back by all the people standing by. Oh, yeah. Um, I bet they were kind of early, but not. They were also kind of Yeah, sure. So we got two hour limit. Surely we'll be done by 10 uh, Let's see. No, I had, I had to be unmuted for the timer to go off. My microphone is zero. This will, this will help trigger me. Who said open mic? Um, you know, I have wireless earbuds and I almost put those in so I could listen to the meeting too. So that way it would cue me to things like that. I wish I had done that now. Oh, you mean? Oh, okay. So I can like on your laptop. From a, no, it's my phone from a YouTube perspective. Oh, yeah. Well, it's always so much further behind. True. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, we just muted something.
Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. We okay? Yeah. Okay. Go. Good. Good evening, everyone. I call to order the Kansas Corporation Commission public hearing regarding docket number 23 EKCE 775 RTS. This docket was initiated by Evergy to request approval to increase its rates. My name is Susan Duffy. I serve as the chair of the Kansas Corporation Commission. My colleagues, Commissioners Dwight Keene and Andrew French, join me in thanking you for participating in this evening's public hearing. This hearing is on the record and the transcript will become an, an important part of the official docket file. May I have the appearance of counsel, please, beginning with staff. Carly Massantine and Asan Latif on behalf of commission staff. Curb. 
David W. Nickel on behalf of Curb. And Evergy. Glenda Kaver, Moore's Lang Law Firm of Topeka and Wichita, Kansas, uh, appearing on behalf of the applicant, Evergy. Does staff have a recommendation regarding notice? Yes, Chair Duffy. Staff has examined notice and recommends a finding that notice was proper. KAR 82-1-228 provides the commission can hold public hearings at any place in Kansas the commission may deem appropriate. KSA 77-518 requires the commission to give reasonable notice of the hearing at least 10 days prior to, the, to its commencement. On May 18th, the commission issued a procedural schedule in this docket which established the date, place, and time for three public hearings and that for a public comment period. On July 5th, Evergy filed its affidavit regarding customer notice in which it detailed and provided examples of its outreach to customers, which included bill inserts for customers receiving mailed paper statements and email for customers receiving electronic statements. For these reasons, staff recommends a finding that notice was proper. Are there objections? Hearing no objections, I find that notice was proper and the commission has jurisdiction at this time and at this place. As stated previously, this hearing is an important part in our process and we look forward to hearing your comments. We cannot engage in dialogue with you during the proceeding. However, we may ask questions for clarification. Um, I have a list of folks here who have signed up to offer comments. I will call your name in the order you appear on the list, and I will also announce the person speaking after you so that you can go ahead and come up to the mic as well. For those participating via Zoom, please use the raise hand feature, and we will alternate between those in person and our Zoom participants. To ensure everyone who wishes to speak has this opportunity this evening, we ask that you limit your comments to three minutes and we do have a timer. Okay, you will be dinged, okay. All right, I'm gonna start with the list here, folks. And I'll do the best I can on your names and I apologize in advance. Also, um, if you could tell us where you're from, not everybody here tonight is from Wichita, so that is helpful to know as well, and we would appreciate that additional information. I'll begin with Jerry uh, Charlton, followed by Shirley Howard. Jerry Charlton, very good. Thank you. I think I, I was on the second page. I think I was like the 40th sign up. You're number one on this first page that's labeled. So how about that? that that's fantastic. All right. So earlier I, in the question in the earlier session, I mentioned, uh, I think the combined goal of Evergy and, and its consumers is introducing efficiency, uh, stewardship of the uh, consumer's pay, uh, pocketbook and stewardship of our, of our environment. So I want to talk about efficiency or comment on efficiency. And uh, I believe maybe just a few of you know that our electrical grid is 35% efficient. That's, that's amazing. I'd like to approach the commission and give you a graph that shows this. It's from the Energy Information Administration. You should be familiar with that. Okay. And I'm sure we've got somebody who can grab that for you. Uh, Brian is heading that way. So you all who are left, this is the heartbeat of America, our national grid for 20 years of demand. It's 35% efficient. And I'm, I'm glad to hear earlier that uh, Evergy is uh, considering natural gas combined cycle uh, power generation that's a 50% energy efficient generation. So um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, oh boy, I need about five minutes. Uh, talk about wind and, nat and natural gas. So, so wind, the, nat uh, the uh, World Economic Forum did a report on wind en energy. The United Kingdom has the best reliability on wind. It's a windy country, but you'd be surprised that it's only 26% efficient. 
So I'm, I'm guessing that Evergy's wind power is maybe 20% efficient. If anybody is aware of that, I don't know. I'm estimating 20% efficient. I heard earlier that uh, we have 4,000 megawatts of wind power. So effectively on an annual basis, we're only generating 800 megawatts of, of that power. So the cost per megawatt for wind is $1.3 million. The cost per megawatt for a natural gas combined cycle facility is $500,000. It's 50% efficient compared to 20% efficient. That's a multiplier of 2.5. So when you're comparing the net generation of power for wind, it's gonna be $3.25 million compared to $500,000 for a natural gas combined cycle facility. We don't need to build any more wind, not at that price. Thank you. Shirley Howard, followed by Bill Newton. First of all, thank you for uh, taking the time and my time, which took me a while to get here. I'm from North Dixon County, and I'm speaking for my age group. 97, but I'm still in the 87, but I'm still in the loop because all these questions that have been asked, I had on my list to talk about. And so therefore, the only question I do really have is I figured up from what you say central and figure it up, it comes to 109,000, 109, thousand four hundred dollars a month you're going to collect just because of the rate increase on the first item in your bill i get what are you going to do with that each what are you going to do with that money oh uh, if it's allowed what are you going to do with it is it going to be infrastructure is it going to be accounted for are we going to know because I, I have a home that I built in 86 and I had KPNL then. I did everything they asked because I had an energy efficient home. They come out, I had a certified electrician. I designed the house myself, built half of it. But anyway, now the price went from 1986 a month, $86, one of the highest bills, up to next session was West Star. It was up between 89 and 100. My bill now, if I use electric, uh, I don't have air conditioning. I live on a hill and I built the house nine inches thick. So I don't use air conditioning. I go to the trailer when it gets 115. It has air conditioning. But if I use air conditioning for $100, without a doubt, $435 in the winter when the snow's blowing outside. And you, so all of these older generation people that are living up my way, which it's Pretty, there's about 35 at least come to the senior citizen centers in the small towns around. They cannot pay that much more anymore. They've, it's, got to, it's got to be slacked off somehow. I would say that I think we waste money. I think we waste a lot of energy. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Newton, followed by Harold Ketcherside. Good evening, Mr. Newton. Good evening. Thank you very much. I'm going to go quick. I have a lot of different points I'm going to cover. I used to be the a liaison between Kansas Power and Light and Western Resources and the cities and municipalities. So I know way too much about energy. I know what went into the rate base that the Kansas Corporation Commission allowed that should not have been allowed. So all that tells me is that the Corporation Commission did not do the forensic study inside of the corporation. 
they did all kinds of studies out there about generation and this and that. And that. Go to salary.com and take a look at the salaries of the executives of Evergy. I mean, we're talking six point eight million, something like that, for the for the CEO, and then there's several million with all the other executives, and they're asking us for a rate increase. Ha! Huh, no way. So the expenses that are going on. Now let me back up real quick. I'm for the legislature to choose the board of directors for Curb and for the KCC and take it away from the hands of the governor. We want our representation all across the whole body here to be to do that. It doesn't mean that you guys are doing a bad job. I just think it could be done a little differently. I'm a free market enterpriser. And if what you're going to say on the salaries is, well, they've got to be competitive. And all I say to that is, then let's open up deregulated energy in the state of Kansas. Evergy gets to buy energy wherever the heck they want to. Why can't you and I? The electricity is different from the transmission lines. He said 10 states have deregulation. There's 13. And I, I, I know a lot about that. And I'm just saying Kansas deserves better rates. And we could get them if we do that. So let me see if I had something else. Um, is that too much? <laughs> Inside of when I was working, there was 30 marketing reps. I think that Evergy should not be able to use $1 to market or advertise, right? It's a monopoly. Why should we give our money so they could advertise to us? That's crazy. So let's shut it down as a monopoly. Oh, you can say that there's a lot of things there, but I'm just telling you, they can, they can advertise when there's an outage, that's not what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. I rest my case. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Harold, catch your side. Are you with us still, Harold? Okay. Melanie Ann Greenwood and Jennifer Conley. Good evening, Ms. Greenwood. Well, hello again. Yes. I'd missed talking to you before. I had a lot of things written on my paper that had to do with money. You guys are talking about a lot of averages, like what the average cost will be to the consumer. And I appreciate very much, I think it was Chuck that said something about how much you are participating in helping those who are think less fortunate than some of the rest of us may be. So you do have some enrichment for the community and help pay for bills who, who, in whom people cannot pay. There's 11.7% poverty. The poverty line in Kansas is $30,000. Now think, and I kind of, did a trick. I took 11% of those CEO and on down there. And I thought that was over $15 million. And I thought, well, um, I think they could give 11% or take away 11% of their salaries. Now we know they're really smart and uh, we want to have competitiveness with other places they could work. But that would give us some maybe 17 mil or 1,722,000 dollars to give to help with those in poverty. And I think that would be a good gold star for Evergy to carry around. And I did have a little question here in the paper. Yesterday, a lady wrote about, it was gonna be 1442 a month. And then later she mentioned it was gonna be 1903 a month. You're gonna raise that. And I wondered which was the truth. No. And also, I want you to know that it's going to take about $1,000 a year for, on average, for each child to pay for lunch in the USD 259. Also, it costs between five dollars and $800 a year 
to send your kid to school, the, the supplies you have to buy. $120 to enroll a kindergartner through fifth grade, $140 a year to enroll a child in middle school, and nobody could give me the average for a high schooler. I took $14 to the grocery store and tried to figure out what I could buy to feed a hungry family. And it wasn't very much. Thank you. Thank you. Right, we'll do one more. Jennifer Connolly. Hi, I'm Jennifer Connolly, and uh, I just wanted to clarify about what happened in Texas. Uh, they were not winterized. Uh, Word and turbines have to be winterized. When you go on the open market to buy energy, you often come up with companies that are not reliable. So if you do go on the open market, you need to be very cautious of how that is uh, distributed and what they do. Uh, and I, I want to talk to you about it's time we increase our base charge. Uh, we still need, we still need to, uh, energy has to be, there's employees that has to be paid, there's administrative costs and there's equipment that continues to happen. And, and what we have done though, is we pitted solar customers against low income customers on false information. Yes, we all must shoulder the burden for the cost to maintain reliable energy. I have questions for you. When will you rip the Band-Aid off and add a time of use charge? It will become mandatory for your Missouri customers. You shouldn't give Missouri customers choices. It's too confusing. <clears throat> People just need to know that a lot more electricity is used at a certain time of day. If you use it during that time, you will pay a lot more. By the way, it's not the exact time of day when solar customers produce energy. To, it's the same time of day that solar customers produce energy to help lower overall usage. With the ability to spool up spinning reserves within minutes, there is no longer a need to run dirty coal plants that must run continuously, whether we use them or not. I believe we should charge a higher base charge, have a time of use charge that reflects the demand which is needed, lower the cost of electricity significantly during low demand times. Basically, if you abuse the grid, you need to pay. If you don't, then you can actually lower your bill. We need as much customer generation as possible and we need to promote community solar. It needs to happen and it needs to happen now. Thank you. We'll turn to the Zoom and we'll take uh, two Zoom calls. Okay, thank you. Um, first is James Young, Mr. Young. Yes, how are you? Good, and you? Good, glad to have this uh, minute to speak with you guys. Okay, so basically what's going on right now is Governor Kelly passed the Panasonic deal before it was actually passed through legislature. Everyone knows who Kayla Messamore is, the vice president of strategy and long-term planning for the electric needs for this sprawling plant testimony. So she actually filed with the FCC, and she actually said in her words, in quotations, the near-term challenges from this resource is in adequate from the per perspective of what they actually can supply. I have several people, John Carmichael, Democrat in the 92nd State District, Rob Olson in the 23rd. Can you still hear me? Yes. yes. All right, sorry, yeah, my phone blinked out. So John Carmichael, I got Rob Olson in the 23rd district who disagrees with this merger and Stephanie Clayton as well. These are people, they're crossing party lines because they don't believe that this is supposed to happen.
there's a lot of things wrong with this. And they really pointed this out. There's no guarantee on salaries or job guarantees. They don't even know what the percentage rake height is going to be per customer. And I'm going to close this down with saying Governor Kelly's spokesperson said in an email, Panasonic energy use will actually cause a downward pressure on utility rates, making it more affordable than the causing that benefit that Kansas rate customers pay. That's not true or else they wouldn't be asking us for money. This is a really bad package. They're already gonna get approximately $8 billion in federal, state, and local tax breaks and incentives. I don't know what Evergy has in this, but they've already promised them a 40% discount on the utility bill for five years. Now, keep in mind, Panasonic is two times the size of the largest company Evergy has ever supplied in their service area. This deal should never have been signed, or at least not signed yet. The power that they're asking for is more than a small city. Thank you. I appreciate your comments. Okay, the next. Uh, next Zoom. is Shannon Thomas. Shannon Thomas. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please uh, make your comment. Okay, so to get to the point, my name is Shannon Thomas. I'm from Hayesville, Kansas. I'm a below poverty level single mother of a one child in high school. And I was, you know, I'm listening. Bills didn't increase, but I am disagreeing with that. I disagree with this raise increase also due to the fact that when the new meters went on, we obviously we weren't given a courtesy email. Just some guy showed up at our house, uh, you know, perhaps someone through the backyard, entered a meter. I called, I asked about it. A few months later, a couple, you know, a year later, my bills are going up. My bill, I'm on the equal pay plan, and my bill used to be 87 and some change a month. So new meters went on, all this other stuff. Now my bill is on average 110 a month. So I called Evergy, and I asked them about this increase on my bill. And they told me that since I'm on the equal pay plan, they redo it every three months now, and they reevaluate our bill. But if that is so, and I've always been on time with my bill and I pay attention, even though I'm in the equal pay plan, I pay attention to what the actual bill is for that month. My bill has gone up. So this whole rate increase didn't happen thing beforehand is kind of a fib. And I'm wondering how much more are we going to have to keep watching our bills go up before some kind of, you know, and courtesy... How can you say that we don't have a rate increase when my bill's higher than it was before and now you want to bill me for some more because of construction and everything else going on? So you just keep asking for more money. How is this? How are we going to fix this? Because I'm a poverty level mom. $15 a month is going to hurt me. That's, that's my question. How, how, how are we going to afford this when? You keep saying the rates aren't going up, but now they are, but they were before anyway. Please explain. Hey, thank you, Miss um, Conley, or who was that? Miss Thomas. Miss Thomas. Next, Kent Rao, followed by um, to Tozy O'Hare. Kent Rao. 
Thank you, commissioners. It's good to be here tonight, and I appreciate your uh, your time. Um, I'm Kent Rowe, Wichita, Kansas, and I uh, was the uh, a judge of papers during the uh, 51st uh, North American Power Symposium, Wichita State University. And what I'm going to relate to you here, hopefully in uh, less than three minutes, is a fix for just about everything we've talked about and what is trending in other states. Um, and forgive me, and, and please don't let down my tires in the parking lot, but time of use billing does open a market for customer generators uh, called prosumers to engage in arbitrage during the highest load demand times. For instance, even low income communities present, pe presently are being afforded the ability to engage in power purchase agreements uh, with entities other than a public utility. A sustainable energy model uh, depends on a modernized electrification of clean, resilient energy. Electric vehicles, when parked, are not in use when hundreds of miles remaining on the range are called upon to participate in demand response. Microgrids operating within commercial and residential storage also aid in the intervals which the grid experiences greater stress. Here's how it works. Each customer can remove its load from the grid during high use hours or when the grid falters and are rewarded through demand response agreements. These agreements are quite permissible through rulings by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC 2222. Virtual power plants, VPP, aggregated and removed from the peak load demands create community resilience. By doing so, major infrastructure investments are avoided and grid resilience is augmented and access to markets is afforded to individuals. Software dispatching of resources of VPPs is not unlike that of large centralized power plants with one great advantage. Are you listening? No transmission lines. No transmission lines. Winter storms Elliot and uh, Uri uh, revealed natural gas plants, coal and fossil fuel plants tripped offline when equipment froze and fuel supplies were cut. Although FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, approved winterization standards for power plants, they don't go far enough and won't be enforceable until 2027. As we speak, historic usages are being set among utilities during the present record-setting heat. Uh, FERC is considering imposing an interregional transfer uh, requirement so certain amounts of electricity can move between given regional territories. Customer generated power plays a vital role in its uh, implementation. Thank you very kindly. Thank you, Mr. Rowe. Miss um, O'Hare, are you out there? No? Okay. Bonnie Stinson, followed by Dennis Hetke, followed by Pat Lehman. Hi, my name's Bonnie Stinson. I am from Bel Air, Kansas, just up the road. Um, I'm going to tell, uh, take this moment to thank Evergy for sending out all their notices about the hearing tonight. It was very helpful, kept reminding me when I got them. Um, I also wanted to tell you that my credits on my bill from this merger, the actual credits that showed up on my bill or twice. One was for 652, the other one was 644. The 652 was actually added to my bill. So I called, they took it off, and I got another credit on that. This didn't even come to the customer fee of 1450. It came to 1296. That's the credit I got from the merger. As far as the um, testimony that's been given. Mr. Campbell came in and was asked about um, the fair and reasonable return on a distribution investment. And he said that the um, ROE, which is the rate of, of return, was 9.3. I think we heard that already. And that investment capital is required to fund beneficial in infrastructure investments in Kansas. External economic and financial conditions in particular 
are a major concern because of the interest rates being higher. So they're suggesting that one of the avenues to raise the rates is so that we can give the stockholders that invest in the company more money back. And I think we've already discussed all that, but Mr. Campbell even recognized that in his testimony. I mean, he, he said that. Also, the transparency part of this, for my part of it, I tried to print off some of these testimonies and I got reference to a lot of different um, tables of which I got to print black pages almost. I don't know if there's a way for them to just put redacted on there or, but my gosh, that's a lot of ink. And it's not too transparent either because that was on the Panasonic and the uh, persimmons wind energy thing. My last one was I took my bill from this last month and based on the schedules that you guys had in all your uh, paperwork, I put my figures to what was on there, and this is proposed. My bill is going to go up at least $25 a month. So $15, I don't know where you're coming up with that, but I can show you that mine will go up at least $25, and that doesn't include the, the fuel used in power generation, the property tax, the the uh, city franchise tax, the tax from the state. Um, so I, I can't understand your figures, but I did take the rate, the, these here, and I figured it up. On this bill that I got last, this month, it was $138. Just those two figures I told you about, came to 8540 but based on the new figures i would pay 108 now something about that doesn't make sense to me maybe i figured it wrong but it sure does look like something's going on that doesn't seem quite right to me and the last thing i want to say is um Thank you all for coming. I know it was a long drive down here and it probably wasn't a pleasant one, but it's hot. So you guys are making money. And um, I also want to thank our state senator, um, Fausto. She comes here every single hearing. I mean, she is like Mama Bear, she's here and she's going to tell it like it is. So I do appreciate her. And I always keep thinking I'm going to write her and I never do. So thank you from me. Thank you. And I'm sorry, um, are you Miss O'Hare sitting here in front? No. Okay. All right. Dennis Hedke, followed by Pat Lehman. Hi. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to reserve my comments uh, to written. So. Very Thank good. Thank you. Thank you. And I will remind everyone, you can submit written comments. We do read them. And I know there will be a lot of them, but just to let you know, Pat Lehman. 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 <laughs> Thank you for correcting it's, it's me. It's German. Yes. And they pronounce it Lehman. All right. Very good. My name is Pat Lehman. I live in Wichita, Kansas. Much of what I have concerns about have already been addressed, but I want to say a couple of things. One, you keep reiterating that there's never been a rate increase, there's never been a rate increase, da 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 da. You haven't talked about the fact that you already filed for another rate increase following this one. And nobody has talked about that. It's sort of the elephant in the room that we're not talking about, but it's already been filed as an emergency. So that's one. Two, I'm tired of getting these PR commercials. I know you say this is to inform our ratepayers about things that are available, yada, da, da, da. It's nothing but happy, smiling faces, and it's nothing but PR, and I'm tired of looking at it. 
And I don't care who's paying for it because ultimately we pay for it. Face it, we pay for it. I mean, that's just the way it is. I'm sorry that you scheduled such a short period of time. I'm thank you for allowing it to go over because I saw it was supposed to end at eight o'clock. Last thing, most people have to pay for their own health insurance unless their employer is paying it. And at 6.8 million, I feel like these folks could pay for their own damn benefits. I don't think we need to be paying for them. And I understand the gizmo gizmo about the life insurance that supposedly helped us all with Wolf Creek, da 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 da. But I don't think we need to be supporting and giving these folks golden paths when the rest of us are struggling. I mean, I am more fortunate than most. I'm old, I'm widowed, I'm handicapped, I'm on a fixed income, but I'm still better off than most people. By the way, your company says I'm not disabled enough <laughs> to qualify for emergency if my electricity goes out. So I have to make sure I have enough batteries charged up all the time so that if the electricity goes out, I don't at least have to stop breathing, but that's, you know, where it is. I applied, you said, no, that's fine. I have lots of batteries. But there are so many people like me who don't have the resources I have. And I am telling you, this is a game changer for them. I predict what will happen is you won't get the full amount that you're demanding because it's ludicrous and I know it and you know it. But you'll get a large portion of it. And then everybody will say, oh, look, we didn't get everything that they asked for. You know, I'm an old negotiator. You always ask for more than you think you're gonna get. And then that way everybody feels real good if you don't get all of it. And I think that's exactly the baffling BS game that's being played here. Thank you. Thank you. And I will remind the audience that we're going to be here until we get done. We're not going home at eight o'clock. We're here until everybody's had a chance to speak. Okay. Just don't, we will get to everyone. I promise that. Okay. Uh, next is Keith Newfeld, followed by Eric Stewie and Tim Just. So, uh, Keith, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the commission and I'd like to thank Ever Evergy for having this meeting. I appreciate it. I'm from the small town of Inman, Kansas, population 1300, and every one of us that live there have to buy Evergy's energy. We don't have a choice. That's the way it is. We know that when we moved there. So I'm an ex <clears throat> a retired ex custom grain harvester. I followed the harvest for 60 of <clears throat> 60 or excuse me, 70 of my 71 uh, 73 years of life with my father and my whatever. So I've seen a lot of the Midwest. I worked in California. I know what kind of shape they're in. Energy wise, what we don't need that in Kansas. Um, <clears throat> my most concern is Evergy, and I wish you'd take this into consideration, commissioners. Uh, you're you have a tremendous amount of uh reputation to keep up. The thing my generation. I'm 73 years old. My generation remembers is the Yahoo that was the president or the ex chief executive officer of Westar who received 40 million to retire. You paid it. Or maybe it isn't right. I don't know, but it's a big amount. And that's what I see when I see Evergy. That's what I saw when I saw Kansas Power and Light. 
I never saw Kansas City power and light, but I see it on Evergy trucks. Last week, you rolled into Inman with six vehicles, one in each vehicle. Five of them were big time service trucks. I know what they are. I have trucks. I had combines. I had all that stuff. But you had one person in each truck, and I don't begrudge any of them for the living they make doing it. I wouldn't want to do it. But they've all parked around the one place we have to buy gas in Inman. And the one, no, we have three places to eat, depending on what day you're there. They parked around there, parked their trucks for I don't know how long. I don't know what they were doing in Inman. But they were there for at least a half an hour, maybe more. Every one of those trucks idled the whole damn time. Now, is that energy conservation? And yet you send me uh, how much juice I use every week. And you congratulate me when I, when I use less, not knowing what the weather conditions are, or you tell me, Ha ha, you did good this week. Uh, I, I like that, but you got a reputation to re when that guy that's driving those trucks and they sit there and idle, that's hard for me to take. Um, my most concern in my small town, not about me, I, I'm fortunate enough, I think I'll be able to pay my light bill. And I love to pay my light bill. I don't want to be without electricity. None of us do. But we want it fair. Um, I'm concerned about my school. What are they going to be able to pay the bill? Or the taxes it's going to take so they can pay the bill, so we can educate our kids. I'm concerned about my retirement center. And I'm concerned about the city of Inman as a whole. Um, thank you for your time. Appreciate you being here. And let's keep turning the lights on. Okay, thank you. Mr. Um, Stewie, Eric Stewie, followed by Tim Just, and then Russ Patuki. Uh, good evening. For the record, Eric Stevie, also German. Guess we're uh, just ganging up on you tonight. Thank you. I apologize. <laughs> um, I guess, first of all, I wanted to just talk about increases in general, um, because as I'm 33. Um, I've got a bit of life left in me yet. Um, and it's been pointed out to me that the Fed, at the, the federal level, they say, you know, we want to have a 4% inflation rate over our lifetime. Well, even just a 2% rate, which is what we had here tonight, a 2% rate every year will cost four times the amount if you are at 70 years old as it did when you were born, okay? So these numbers, I want everybody just to kind of imagine the price that you pay right now multiplying by four and that's what it's going to cost for that energy in 70 years. And I just don't think that's an effective way to do this. Um, at some point, we got to get these rates where they're going down because we can't just keep increasing costs for everybody all the time. Um, even if it was one and a quarter percent per year, that'd be significantly better over time for us to be able to afford. Um, I also have my concerns about wind energy is not as um, affluent as your, your coal, your oil. Um, I think a lot went, went down in Texas was just they had the wind that went down and they didn't have everything else that was ready to pick up for it. And if we would supplement our stuff with the natural gas, with the coal, with the oil that we actually have here, Instead of depending more and more on wind and solar, which are going to go up and down. And when they're down, you got to find some way to pick up for them. 
And it's just not a sustainable system for someone like me that's still going to be around, hopefully, God willing, in 30 years. Um, so I would ask that we not only try to find a way to get these costs where we're not asking for so much increases all the time, but also that we think about something where we have sustainability of energy all the time. And whether that's having stores in place for when the wind can't pick it up, or whether we have more oil, more uh, natural gas available. I appreciate that we got natural gas coming online. Um, Bias asked for the sustainability to be there for us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Just, are you still in the audience? Nope. Okay. Russ Patuki, are you in the audience? Janice um, Steinick, Janice. Okay. Mary Dean. Mary Dean. Greg Hesse. Larry Thurston. Okay. Feel like this is roll for school and nobody came. Uh, Brandon Whipple. He left. Okay. Kevin um, Kuhn. Kevin Kuhn. We still have three Zoom people. Left. Okay, we'll get there. Um, Celeste Russell. Reset. Celeste, yay. All right. It's getting late, but thank you, Chairman Duffy and commissions for having this meeting. My name is Celeste Reset. I'm a fourth generation Kansan, a resident of Wichita and candidate for mayor. I have an accounting degree, an MBA, was a chief internal auditor and an FDIC bank examiner and fraud investigator. I have heard a lot of great questions tonight and information from the citizens that are still here tonight. I heard about Wolf Creek, cost of wind versus solar and natural gas, transferring kilowatts outside Kansas, especially Texas, good questions, advertising costs, which are absolutely unnecessary for a monopoly, depreciation accounting changes that inflate expenses, and you could not answer my question, executive salaries, I worked 60 hours a week. I did not come anywhere close to making a million dollars a year. These are unanswered questions you have promised to answer. If those answers do not show up on the website, who will answer them? Who will be held accountable? I heard a name, Roxy, would be on the accounting staff who'd answer my questions. I'd like to exchange business cards so I really get an answer. When the merger occurred, a requirement was put on you to hold costs down, but now I hear you say that this proposed price increase is needed because utility prices were held down. But wait a minute, wasn't this part of having the merger is to hold the costs down and now you wanna make up for it? That doesn't make sense. This was the price of the merger, so quit complaining. Don't jack your prices up. You got a merger, you're a monopoly, deal with it. And charging us for an accounting change that makes depreciation expense more expensive by shortening the useful life on capital assets? That's not fair. Who came up with that change? I want to see curb staff analysis on this accelerated expense and the accelerated expense, depreciation expense for the Panasonic capital. I want to see the accounting numbers. I want to see the justification. That's called cost accounting. And I'd certainly take $6 million to set up a cost accounting on those projects to get the numbers. The return on equity should be lowered below 10%, and I suggest 9% as a nice collaborative compromise with the folks that have stayed here tonight to talk to you. I'll end by saying Evergy is a utility monopoly that pays generous dividends to its stockholders. I get that. I understand dividends for utility stocks. And yet your executives earn lucrative rewards and salaries and benefits, and you're not at risk of financial collapse. This rate increase proposal is an opportunistic 
effort by the company to reward its stockholders and executives. And I urge you to put the brakes on this proposed rate increase. You've got a second one pending. Thank you, Pat Lehman, for bringing that one up. So slow the brakes down. This is too expensive and difficult for those on fixed incomes. And I implore you to compromise. And I'm looking forward to those accounting numbers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mary Ann Harmon. Followed by Senator Fausto and Richard Harris. Hi, good evening. Um, I uh, I really want to oppose the um, centralized energy generation. It requires immense distribution resources, AKA the high voltage transmission lines that scar our landscape. The poles that desecrated the neighborhoods of Northwest Wichita are abhorrent. Now the Red Bud Trail will be decimated due to the new lines being planned. Um, the cost to connect a power generating plant to the grid approaches a billion dollars. And it's a great impediment to moving forward to low cost, uh, um, low carbon power. Evergy needs to be investing in localized power generation and less in transmission lines so that this huge price increase is not needed. Also, further reduction of costs are achieved through decentralization due to um, reduction in line loss. Um, as much as 15% can be lost during long distance transmission. A more decentralized system is naturally more resilient and greatly reduces the impact of damage to the electric grid. Evergy has been in the courts forever regarding how to charge those who help to contribute to this decentralized system. Evergy must stop discouraging decentralized energy generation and stop this insane growth of transmission lines and rates. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Senator, followed by Richard Harris and Mary Arterburn. Um, good evening, uh, Commissioners uh, Evergy. Thank you for being here uh, tonight. Um, it was a scorcher today. It was so hot. Just walking from my vehicle to the, to the door, I was sweating. Um, I am here on behalf of those senior citizens and people on fixed incomes. Um, you're going to raise the rate. Their income will stay the same. Uh, I've received calls from the uh, AARP members, uh, uh, from uh, the Kansas Silver Hair Legislature members. Um, actually, I know senior citizens right now that are home and they only have a boxed fan. It is terrible out there. Um, so we do need the um, energy from Evergy. And more than likely, the rates will go up eventually. I'm just here tonight to plead, commissioners, please, um, lower that increase. Perhaps in the future, look at You've got all of, Evergy has a listing. I introduced legislation to try to get a listing of those on fixed in incomes. Because if you raise the rate across the board, some will be able to pay and some won't. And with this type of weather, uh, deaths will incur. Um, it is sad, it, it is sad. And even your regular little ACs in the window, they're not even working correctly on these hot days. And so uh, please consider those on fixed incomes who receive Meals on Wheels. And Madam Chair, if I may, I'm going to yield my time real quick to um, uh, um, this guy. Say your name. I'm done. Tracy C. Mason, Sr. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, uh, real quick, uh, it's 2023, and I'm still trying to figure out how we got here. I've heard a few times people mention uh, elderly and fixed incomes. Okay, um, I deal with two elderly couples that have fixed incomes. 
and through this summer, they've suffered. Uh, I help them with food the best I can with the food pantry that I have, and they go other places as well, but they've suffered. Um, I'm going to use a word, and I hope it doesn't shock, shock an eye anybody, but to have those two that I know that is on fixed incomes and they're suffering, um, they're older, they're in their 80s. Um, the young lady, uh, well, the mother is still, she says she's 21 still, but she's in her 80s. Um, you'll murder them. You'll murder them. You'll kill them. If you raise their rates and they're on this fixed income and one and, and the one couple has one child and that child is an elderly couple, is an elderly child, and is far away in another state, they can't afford a raise. And I just can't believe that I'm sitting here in 2023 discussing a rate increase that will murder elderly fixed income people. And it's not even been really thought of like you don't care. And I don't know who I'm talking to when I say like you don't care, but if you don't care, I'm talking to you. Um, you'll murder people. You, you, it may be one person, but that one person matters to somebody. But you will literally murder. There are two couples that I'm dealing with. And they're on fixed incomes. So you got all the numbers. You got all the data. You got all the stuff. You got it all. Hell, you got intelligence. You got PhDs. You got people that did all the research for you. And we stuck here in 2023 with saying we're going to risk murdering people that can't pay for, for electric in the winter when it's cold, air in the summer, when it's hot. And right now, it's hot. And next, what are you saying? Next year, okay, we'll give them a year. We'll let them live a year, kick the, the rates in on them, and they won't be able to pay them. And then I'll knock on the door, won't get an answer, have to call 911 for a welfare check because they can't pay your increase and you don't care. I ask for compassion and care. That's all I ask for. Thank you. Thank you. Richard Harris, followed by Mary Arterburn. Hi, Richard Harris, Wichita. I'm a former chairman or commissioner of several city boards and a former member of the National Panel of Consumer Arbitrators of the Better Business Bureau. Uh, and looking at the rate increase request, one concern that I have is it was brought to me by uh, somebody knowledgeable in the industry said that you were looking for a 9.77% increase. And in reality, the uh, that could translate into a 12% residential increase, which is considerable. Um, surrounding states, you pointed out, have made better uh, uh, rates uh, for, for their investors. However, you overlooked the fact that Kansas, unlike most of those surrounding states you cite, has a much higher wind potential, far higher wind potential than almost all of those states, with the exceptions of Oklahoma and Texas. Oklahoma and Texas are dominated, as we all know, by oil and gas interests who have shot down the proper uh, infusion of wind energy into their electric grids. Um, but with wind energy, you're not paying for the factors of production. So you're getting that energy to some extent for free compared to what you would have been if you'd been in one of the other states that was reliant entirely on fossil fuels for their energy. Uh, you're asking for a rate increase to maintain and improve a, a grid, but you're, you should have done this all along with the money that you had. Uh, you're asking for the rate payers to provide you with the money when you could go out and borrow that money on the open market and then repay it with the efficiencies that you claim these improvements will produce. Now, that's assuming you're not lying about those efficiencies. Your return on equity request is to go from 9.3% to 10 and a quarter percent. That's ridiculous. 
A report from Standard & Poor's last year, exactly a year ago today, said that the average rate nationwide is 9.38%, just slightly above what you're at now. And even for integrated utilities, uh, vertically integrated utilities, it's 9.47%, so a little more than what you already have. More importantly, the trend nationwide is for regulators to reduce that rate, not increase it. And in fact, in the first six months of 2022, the regulators all on average cut that rate down to 9.2% below what you're getting now. If KCC wants to be consistent with the industry averages, they will cut, cut your rates, not increase them. It's time to stop asking the obvious question. Why are we asking for more when less is the trend? It's a question of poor management. And if the management hasn't had the ability to use the opportunity to get low interest rate loans and do this work years ago when they had a decade of record low interest rates to do it, we shouldn't be rewarding incompetent and irresponsible management now. We should be replacing them. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Otterburn, are you here? Okay. We want to do sure. Two. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll take a couple of Zoom calls. Um, Martha Boatwright, Miss Boatwright. Hello. Hi, my name is Martha Boatwright. I'm calling in from Topeka because I just watched the Topeka, um, the Topeka uh, energy energy hearing, and you know it just made me really really frustrated. And I'm here to talk my little bit now. Um, this isn't really even for you people on the board, because honestly, I don't think you're going to listen to me. It's for the people in the audience. I hear a lot of people basically making appeals to the goodness of the heart of Evergy, asking them to do the right thing. Oh, it'll improve your reputation. It'll give you gold stars. You know, it's, it's the right thing to do. You're going to murder people. But they're a private corporation. They don't have a conscience. They don't care. They're here to make a profit for their shareholders. And as previously noted, their shareholders aren't just you know, ordinary people here in Kansas. They're big companies like Vanguard. They're big venture corporate people that just like this to invest in utility companies because they're a sure bet. Because energy is something we all need. It's a demand. We're always gonna pay for it. It always has to be supported or else you know, the whole society will collapse. The reality is they talk about how all these costs that they had to socialize. We always socialize the costs. We never socialize the profits. The profits go to the pockets of the small number of people who have share, who are able to invest large amounts of money in these corporations, in these private energy companies. The reality is it doesn't have to be like this. If we, we can, if, if, if the public needs energy, if we are gonna sit here and debate how we best serve the public good, why don't we let the public decide that? You say that we can't have the government, our democratically elected government have a say in running our company. We can't have them run the company because it would be inefficient. I'm gonna let everybody know that when economists say inefficient, they mean it won't make enough money. If things are more efficient, they'll make more money because they'll cut costs and they'll raise prices. And that's how they make a profit. That's how they're more, quote unquote, inefficient. And I don't know about anybody else, but I'll take a little bit of inefficiency for a lot less injustice. They are going to make their profits to pass over to Vanguard and venture capitalists while doing it on the backs of people who are retired, people with disabilities. This is nonsense and we should not be putting up with it. Now, I understand. I understand that they are a private company right now and it would be so bad for us to take their private property away. But I've also been listening to all these people who have had their private property get taken away by Evergy to put in lines and things. For some reason, eminent domain always applies to private individuals, but never to these large companies that are causing such a huge impact on our economy and our people and their daily lives. Not to mention, oh my gosh, our environment. We are in the hottest summer of the year. The planet is dying. We need to shift away from carbon fossil fuels right now. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. 
Uh, and now Emily Tallman, uh, Miss Tallman. Hi, I'm Emily Tallman. I am in Topeka. Um, I just wanted to implore to the board um, once again, please, please, when you're considering this, to remember how close so many people are to just one unexpected expense making them homeless. Um, so many people are already struggling with what we have. And to add on, it, it may not seem much to many people, you know, oh, it might be 12 to $16, you know, but it, for so many people, that is a huge m amount a month. And I would like to, if I could tell you a story. Um, when I was still just a teenager, I would stay at home uh, and watch my siblings during the day because they were two and three years old. Um, we were very poor. And one day the power company did come up to our door, knocked just to say, hey, uh, do you guys got the, the money for, for the bill? I uh, just want to check one more time before we cut it off. And I'm just a kid. I say, no. There's nothing here. And he took one look at me. And he took one look at my little baby brother and sister. And he said that he did not have the heart to cut off our power then. As a person, he could not do it. And so I want everyone to remember that these are real families out there that this affects. And it's not just the people that are able to come out here and talk tonight. There's children out there that this is going to affect. There are the elderly out there, the disabled out there that this is going to affect. And, you know, people that have no idea that this is even going on right now, that it's going to affect. Please remember them and consider them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, from our audience, David Griffiths. David Griffiths, followed by James Carr. Okay, David's not here. James Carr, Jane Burns, uh, Jerry or Gary Wiles. Good, thank you. I'm Gary Wiles. I live in Wichita, Kansas, and my wife and I are retired. And we're on a fixed income. And what that means is that every month we have to try to make it with the money we have. And we have issues at our house with plumbing. And we have automotive issues. And we have medical issues and dental issues. And we, we, were, we are just barely keeping our head above water right now. We're treading water. And we're starting to slip a little bit and go under. And we just can't afford this. It's just, we just can't afford it. I mean, we're going to be done here. I mean, we don't, last, last paycheck, last time we got paid from our pay period. And at the end of that pay period, I ended up with $30 in the bank. That was it. Other than a couple of thousand we've got saved. And we just, I mean, where's it going to stop at? I mean, we're just going to keep raising prices and raising prices and raising prices. It's just not the way to do it. I mean, we got to stop somewhere and say, okay, how can we work together and cut prices? Other than just people don't use your electricity and your price will go down. That's not the answer either on days like today or weeks like this week or next week, that other guy was right. You, you're going to end up, people are going to end up dying from this if they can't pay their electric bill. We're a little more fortunate than most people, okay, than a lot of people here. We're, we're in a little bit of better shape. I mean, we could probably give this up or give that up and maybe make it. But a lot of other people who are on fixed incomes and all they have is Social Security, they're not going to be able to make it. And that's what I wanted to say. 
And I'm speaking for my wife and myself. Thanks. Thank you. Michael Rumford, followed by Virginia Macha. Michael? Good. Then Virginia Macha and Lori Lawrence. Thank you for an opportunity to speak to you. Oh, got a little stiff sitting in a chair so long. Uh, <laughs> we've heard a lot of information here today. Uh, one of the things that I learned was that schools and churches are going to have different rates of this new deal, which we're going to come out of our tax dollars anyway. So we're going to pay for that on top of the rates that are going to be imposed on us. Um, go back in history, July 2nd, 1890, the Sherman Antitrust Act. It was the first federal act that outlawed mon monopolies in business. I don't think the federal government should be playing around with our state, but I don't believe our state should have allowed an energy corporation to become a monopoly because they can pretty much do whatever they want to. All they do is keep throwing the paper in front of you, and sooner or later, somebody's going to up the prices, and we really need not to do that. Uh, Wolf Creek was a wonderful thing, came online, and all that energy got shot up in the northeast part of the state, on on into Missouri. Um, Evergy did not receive any increase for five years, according to their agreement. But according to the Topeka Capital, I dug this up, in February of uh, 2022, the corporation reported $854 million in non-GAAP earnings in 2022. And that GAAP is an alternate method used to measure the earnings of the corporation. So it's not really like they're broke. I really hope the commission will deny their request for an increase. Thank you. Thank you. Virginia? Yes, please good, go. Good evening, commissioners. Um, thank you for this opportunity to address you about the average increase. What I've heard is pretty heart rendering. I've lived this for 18 months and I've watched landowners lose their land by eminent domain. I've watched an energy line that you allow to take our land for a for profit company actually move a line. We're now an old man of 87 years old has to live under this power line. During that hearing, what I heard was a lot of questions from the commissioners. A lot of questions about, is this the end of eminent domain? Is this the end of the cost increase? Most customers in Southeast Kansas hasn't even received their 16.8% cost of that line. And most of those customers won't even benefit from the electric from that line. Placing that kind of burden on fixed incomes um, is very heart rendering. And this energy increase, it'll be just as impactful as that transmission line. And so I got to thinking about how we ever got into this position of <clears throat> not knowing from year to year, from day to day, how much the cost of energy is going to cost us because the federal government uh, passed an act so that every American can live the American dream. They could have affordable and reliable electric. And somehow that dream and that energy compact and bill that they passed that has served us so well for years and years has now become a football. And in Kansas, we're not doing the right thing for Kansas. What is Kansas's energy policy? We don't have one. What is their transmission policy? We don't have one. So tonight I ask this commission, <clears throat> no matter what, what politics you have, we're all Americans and we all enjoy our freedom. I ask you to throw the flag on this right hearing and get a real plan for power and energy for Kansas. Stop this special group rates over here, um, customer burden um, <clears throat> for infrastructure 
It's not fair for just regular customers. I've watched this KCC commission testify in committee hearings and their figures don't balance out. When they say everybody, the average in Kansas has been decreased by 0.01% of energy costs. When they say, well, the residential went up 1.4. Oh yeah, and the industrial went up 1.6. So who the heck got the discount? And so we have to stop and say, what is the best thing for Kansas? Let's get a plan. Because so far what I've seen is no transparency, policies that apply differently across the board. And there's not reliability or security for any resident of Kansas to ever achieve the American dream. And so tonight, that's what I ask you is to throw the flag and get a plan. Because right now we feel confused frustrated, and very uh, <clears throat> worried about our freedom here. Thank you. Lori Lawrence, followed by Jackie Eckert and Charlie um, Teaster. Hi, I am Lori Lawrence. I'm here in Wichita, Kansas. Um, I would, of course, like to echo what everyone else is saying, and please don't approve these rate hacks. I do appreciate that Evergy has done at almost half of their energy production with renewables. I've always been proud to say that when I talk with some of my environmental groups. The fact that you've decided now to not increase the renewables any further is concerning to me personally. Um, and that you've decided to not close the hazardous coal plants like the one outside of Lawrence that you had said you were going to retire and now you're not is concerning for not only us here but those people there. Since the um, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency earlier this year issued new emission standards for power generation units focused on the impact for coal-fired plants, it is time to do this. The rule would require most fossil fuel burning power plants to reduce their greenhouse gas pollution 90% by 2040. There's an easy way to stop that. You just have to shut them down. That's the only way to make that happen. Evergy's rates are already high. We all agree. Uh, the KCC must not allow them to price gouge their customers. We have no choice to use another at utility because state law requires regional monopolies. Evergy is also a for-profit company and they have shareholders. The state also mandates certain level of dividends to these shareholders. I believe that's 9.3% now and you're asking to increase that. There isn't any other investment that has state regulations mandating dividends. Every other business that has stock that you buy contains some risk. Evergy does not. Investors should be the ones to face the risk instead of us when the company they invest in fails to plan for catastrophic events. Consumers have no choice and should not be forced to pay for Evergy's bad planning. When the KCC makes a report to each legislature once a year only, they need to include a request to remove that required dividend as requested by the public here. It needs to be removed. Increasing rates is not fair for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie Ecker. Jackie. Charlie. Harrison Dollar. followed by Faith Martin and Bill Wentz. Good evening. I applaud everyone in the audience uh, for waiting this long. It is getting late and I, I will give uh, props for both the commission and Evergy for uh, staying this long and not ending it at the time that it was supposed to. The rate increase is a symptom of the problem. At the end of the day, 
the reason the rate increase is happening and the reason why it's going to happen again or could potentially happen again. And from learning tonight, there has been one already filed, so it's likely to happen. But the reason why it's happening is because Evergy is a monopoly. And I strongly oppose the fact that it is a natural monopoly. See, the word natural means that it occurs without any manufacturing. But if that was the case, long time ago at this point, but the, the question I asked was if Evergy had any suites for professional sports games for state lawmakers, a tactic used for lobbying. Why is so much lobbying occurring if it's a natural monopoly? Why would you have to protect your interest if it's a natural monopoly? See, this is the root of the issue because it's not. It is a company that is pursuing their own interest at the cost of their customers. That is a huge issue. As we heard today, real people are going to be impacted by this quite severely. So what is the solution? Well, Monopoly is not going to fix the problem because their customers have no choice. So the only solution is the Kansas Corporate Commission. And unfortunately, I don't have too much faith that they will make the right decision. That is why this body in front of me needs to be electable. If the body was electable, there's no chance this rate increase would go through. Because if it did, in all truth, the body probably would not be elected again. This is a pragmatic solution. I've heard many problems, but not many solutions. So we have to rally behind the solution and focus on the real problem, not the symptom of the problem that may hurt very bad, but symptoms are reoccurring. And this symptom will reoccur again if we don't fix the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Faith Martin, Bill Wentz, Ricky Bryant, Donna Bryant. Okay, we'll, we'll go back to Zoom. Uh, Ty Gorman, M Mr. Gorman. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, Evergy wants to increase the average residential electric bill by more than $170 each year. And uh, there's got to be so much more help from Evergy reducing bills for low income customers overall and protecting vulnerable customers from disconnections, but especially in this heat. But on top of that, uh, we're not getting the bang for our buck from that rate increase that we should because we're overinvested in coal compared to other utilities. Coal power uh, is the most expensive form of energy that uh, the customers are going to have to continue to pay for. And now they say they'll make a terrible investment in expensive gas in the near future. Meanwhile, we're underinvested in solar or efficiency programs that could save customers hundreds of millions of dollars. Clean energy beats 99% of proposed gas on cost at the same level of reliability when you take into account the Inflation Reduction Act and federal funding. And coal is even worse when <laughs> with uh, federal dollars, it's cheaper to build new, completely new solar, wind, storage, and efficiency uh, and connected to the grid than it is to merely keep running over 99% of coal plants. Really, all of the 210 coal plants, except for one, are uh, cost more to just keep running than it does to invest in new clean energy. And, uh, you know, this is a clean energy portfolio that is with uh, rooftop solar, uh, even makes it even more cost effective, according to the New England ISO. But these other numbers come from S&P, IHS markets, uh, Credit Suisse data, ICF data, it's all this publicly available data. And make no mistake that the winter storm, Uri and Texas failed because of the natural gas industry's inability to deliver reliable energy. And that problem has not and will not be fixed. All publicly funded analysis agrees on this. So all this data 
is based on reliability, on capacity. It's not just the energy. So it's basically building enough renewable energy, clean energy, that it can run exactly like a coal plant with solar, wind, home efficiency, demand response, and storage. And without the, all the ups and downs in fuel cost and availability from like the gas fuel and the coal fuel uh, price spikes. And the coal industry has been in decline for a long time. And uh, we know Evergy can slash costs and provide reliable power at lower costs by investing in clean energy because Oklahoma Public Service Company, just south of Wichita, just did it. Oklahoma PSO is getting rid of its coal, reducing emissions enough to meet international climate goals and reducing prices for its customers. By the second year, customers, all its customers will be saving money because it's investing in clean energy and retiring its coal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Josh uh, Seibler. Josh, did I mangle that correctly? It's uh, it's perfectly all right. Siebenaller, another German last I, name. All right. <laughs> um, so I am Josh Siebenaller. I live in the McDonald neighborhood of Wichita, abutting the Redbud Trail. I want to note for the record, and sir, I see you looking at me now, but I don't appreciate ever, ever for the record, Evergy's VP looking at his phone while folks are talking. It's disrespectful. We've been here as long as you have. And also for the record, it's kind of bullshit. Um, I want to make my position clear. There's nothing I've seen tonight that changes my opposition to this rate increase. Should you vote to approve it, uh, there are Kansans who will suffer. Evergy shareholders, one of the three groups that you need to consider, will be just fine. These they're Kansans, and the power that we generate should not be mined by out-of-state financial entities. Evergy highlights their value to these shareholders in their most recent annual report, a 10.1% annualized growth in earnings per share and 6.6% .6 annualized growth in dividends per share. And they've done that without raising their base rates for the last five years, while raising every other rate that doesn't fall under this board's purview. As we've heard tonight, we're all seeing increases in our bills. So who will this base increase benefit? It's not us. You've heard the names, the Vanguard Group, the T. Rowe Price Group, the Capital Group companies, entities based in Pennsylvania and Delaware that those three together control more $11 trillion in assets. 85% of Evergy is owned by groups just like that. What do we get out of this legally required corporate monopoly? A company that cavalierly asks for millions of dollars, uh, when, citing being competitive when it is by law, the only business in town. A company that last year took in more than $5.859 billion in revenue and over $700 million in profits, again, without raising its base rates. And a company that can pay its executives millions of dollars, the top six by themselves earn more than $18 million, according to their SEC filings. And we know, we've heard it, they're going to attempt to raise their rates later this year under the guise of the Panasonic construction. So to reiterate, Evergy shareholders are going to be fine. Kansans will not be. The KCC's chief responsibility should be to Kansans and not these out-of-state organizations that control more money than you, I, or anybody in this room could ever imagine. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. Amy LaBelle, and then followed by Janelle Davey and Randy Rogers. Good evening. Hello. It's been a long night. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of concerns and this might be something you should take into consideration. Uh, I've noticed a lot of cell phone towers going up and they're humongous structures and it looks like they have their own little substation. I would like to know who's paying for that. Is that coming out of our electric bill? Because I don't think it's coming out of our cell phone bill. Um, and how much does it cost to operate one of those, like kilowatt hours? Uh, what is it? What, what are they consuming? And I don't know if anyone remembers the conservation rate that we used to have the option for on our electric bill, but I would like to see that returned. And that was for people who could use under so many kilowatt hours a day, and then you would get a discount. I think maybe October through March or April, you get a 25% discount. This was with Weststar. 
Is anyone familiar with that up at the front? It was for people who were making an effort to conserve. And I used to do that. I actually still do that. Um, I wish that when you do submit your your uh, your dockets, Evergy, that you could not submit such um, large files. I would like to read through it, but it's kind of difficult to get through 500 pages. <laughs> um, but I did. I was able to read through a couple of pages, and I noticed that you want us to pay for the cost of the IT systems. And that I guess would be the mobile apps and that sort of thing. And I'm opposed to that. I don't want to pay for that. And I am opposed to the rate increase. And just to let you know, I do keep my my air up pretty high. I've got it at 86 right now because I don't want to fork out a huge bill to Evergy. And I'll do whatever I can to keep it low. And maybe more of us need to do that. I mean, if I could boycott energy and buy my own solar panels, I would do that for sure. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Janelle Davey, Randy Rogers. Hey, Kate. Is there a K in the room? <laughs> okay. All right, Lonnie Barnes. Okay, good. Lonnie followed by Emily Stone and Jim uh, Binage. Good evening. I'm gonna to pretend to be Lonnie here, but I'm gonna refute what the individual on the Zoom call you know, talked about uh, renewable So energies. your name is? Jerry Charlton. Jerry, did you speak earlier? I did. Okay, can we just move on to the next person? And um, so, Emily, are you here? Jim? Yep, Jim is here, good. Followed by Beverly Cook and Chris, looks like uh, Charlton. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Jim Benage. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to voice concerns on this proposed rate increase. I am the mayor of Bel Air, which is uh, here just one mile north of here. Uh, we will uh, be the home of the new Integra Technologies uh, chip facility. I do not have any knowledge about special rates for Integra, like you've had for Spirit or possibly Panasonic. So I have no discussion about that. Uh, we uh, know you are looking at the need to serve the needs for Integra, and we appreciate that, uh, that we would be able to get the uh, needed power that they need. So, but let's be honest about this rate increase. Evergy has had a five-year moratorium on rate increases due to cost efficiencies expected by the combined uh, companies. And this rate increase is an attempt to recover past ink rate increases that were uh, not allowed to be applied for due to the moratorium. Evergy profits are solid. They have done a great job at reducing costs, but in their own testimony uh, tonight, their rates are still higher than others in the region, um, even though they have a lock on their customer base at almost half the state of Kansas and 70% of electrical users in Kansas. So a $14 per month rate increase is not all the consumers will see. Uh, this proposal increases 25% for churches and, and municipalities. So churches will need more donations to continue the same service level of charity that they currently serve. Uh, cities will need more tax revenue to pay for the increases in electrical rates. Schools will be the same way, they'll need more tax revenues as well. And those all fall on the consumers because the consumers pay their those taxes. Uh, retiring coal plants and charging back unrealized depreciation, if that is a more cost efficient option, then the cost savings repays their unrealized depreciation. Uh, if that is not the case, then you have no, not made the case to retire these plants. 
And in either case, unrealized depreciation should not be a factor in this rate case. <clears throat> to be clear, I do have an MBA and I recognize the need for Evergy to make a profit uh, that is established in law and as our KCC is well aware. So we appreciate Evergy and the service you provide. The rate increase is just too big of a burden and may not be justified for the citizens in the central service territory. So I thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Beverly Cook. Chris. Are you Chris? Uh, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank well, you. Come on down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, I will answer his question that he was concerned about something on the air. Uh, the idea that wind and, and solar is more efficient than natural gas is uh, fool's gold. So um, what I would recommend is I don't think there is, seems to be a plan moving forward. Got another re, you know, increase coming down the path. Um, it seems like Evergy is like all about raising rates to raise the revenue. How about just going out and raising revenue? You have from 10 p.m. at night till 6 a.m. the next day for to capture more revenue. And I, like I said earlier, I sell electric trucks. So it's like, let's get some incentives from Evergy to encourage electric vehicles that could be charged during that time frame from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., which is the you know for the next day, for you know the duty cycle for UPS, FedEx, things like that. That is the low rate. That is when our whole idea in our industry, our eco ecosystem of electric trucks. I've been in it for the last six years, and trying to get Kansas to get on board with this. After I talked earlier, I had six people come up to me and goes, you're, you're totally on board. Let's let's talk with clean cities and things like that. I would recommend pausing this rate increase to see what they could do to fund incentives to start you know, powering electric vehicles at night, not, not residential, but more the, the UPS, the FedExes, those things that when they when they charge at that time of the day, that's when the grid you know, you can generate more revenue then. Let's work at, let's work on generating more revenue instead of raising rates. Thank you much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Maxine Bostic. Great, followed by Dennis Woodworth and Carl Peterjohn. Good evening. Good afternoon. I thought you couldn't read my writing. I thought I was pretty good at it. <laughs> you were. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm Maxine Bostic, and uh, thanks for being the last utility to raise uh, our rates, and I know why. I read quite well. I'm a retired educator. Thanks for leveling rates. Uh, gas and water uh, almost double their rates. Uh, my request as a retired educator, a senior citizen who has worked for all of the income I receive, I don't want welfare. Please don't raise the senior citizens' electric electricity rates. I take, like many of you, every step I can afford to reduce usage. Uh, example, it's a little ironing weather stripping on doors, washing early, uh, reducing watering of my yarn, a lot, I can go on and on. But we as senior citizens, we pay the taxes, we pay our tithe, we pay for the school kids, we volunteer, we donate, and we would appreciate your rate raises be at least 50% of the pro proposed rate are prorated. Consider, uh, if you are old now, keep living, <laughs> and you might need to appeal also. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis Woodworth. Good, I think he's coming down, followed by Carl Peterjohn and Jennifer McCoy. 
So, Mr. Woodworth, yes. welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I want to step aside for just a second. This lovely lady, if your husband was a principal here in town, I worked for him. Our kids went to school that he was named after, could not have known a better, nicer person. Yes. So, anyway, uh, just looking back a little bit history, I just pushed a little over 70. Still consider myself young since my grandmother lived to 102. KGE was in business for 83 years. In the next 30 years, our electricity company bills have come through three different companies. You don't usually sell something unless or buy something unless you think you can make money off of it. You know, that just, you know, wonderful, you know, but looking at some things, Evergy has had, you know, been five years since they have been the company that have served us. After I taught, I then went out and designed helicopters and jets for Boeing, Cessna, Beach. And one of the things I realized is when your name is above the door, you take a lot of pride to make that work and become successful. I don't know if any of you knew that Boeing built furniture when things were down. You know, Mrs. Beach would go out, stand up on you know, a million dollars piece of equipment just to check and see how it is. When a company is owned by the person that started it, they have a huge investment in what they are doing. And, you know, they want to see it succeed. I would like to see us as Kansas succeed, opposed to just feeling like we are being utilized for somebody else's benefit, you know, which really concerns me. Um, with that said, there is many other opportunities that I think your organization, Ergy, can do to reduce rates to the benefit of our cus customers, or you would not have been thinking, hey, I can make a profit by purchasing, you know, this section of the United States. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Peter John. Commissioners, staff, thank you very much for your attention and time. Uh, my name is Carl Peter John, and I was a former county commissioner for eight years, and uh, I've been a resident here in Sedgwick County for 45 years. Actually, I'm in Wichita. And I wanted to provide some general and appreciation that we've got reliable electricity because that's been a problem. It's a growing problem, in fact, because the rate increase proposal here uh, ties into this, especially around the country, when you look at increased brownouts and blackouts and our whole policy that seems to be moving in the direction of more inefficient and unreliable production of energy. However, to narrow down these comments in the time I have left, I'd like to focus upon the disparity, much higher rate increase for folks in the Northeast from here. When I moved to Wichita in the late 70s, uh, there were a number of cases where the rates as part of this merger process went on, folks down here paid a higher percentage. And this effort, they say it's a disparity that they're paying more. I, I think that that's excessive at this point. And also the total amount of 204 million is also uh, excessive too. The return on equity has been mentioned by others and I agree this proposal for a 10% hike from 9.3 to 10.25% is also excessive. The accelerated depreciation, this is a continuing problem, especially in light of uh, as we move away from reliable energy to intermittent, the COLI, C-O-L-I, for uh, 29 million for Evergy. I don't believe that this is a cost that should be placed on ratepayers. And I will mention for the record, there have been prior cases where I've testified against some of the West Star rate increases. Now, I'm going to take advantage of your willingness to read comments, and I will revise and extend these remarks uh, to cover 
a broader case, but uh, I do want to close with the point that um, this integrated resource plan may make our energy situation less reliable if we go to sources that are not reliable or only operate part of the time. And I cite the, and there's public, increasing public concern. There's been some national news coverage uh, up in Northeast Kansas, Osage County, for instance, has put a moratorium on windmills in their county. Uh, and there's other groups that are saying, hey, let's not move so quickly for intermittent unreliable uh, sources. So I think the IRP needs careful examination. We need a more competitive environment that does not rely on government power like eminent domain. I really have a problem with that in the private sector. I appreciate the commissioners and staff's time and attention. Thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, Jennifer McCoy. Are you still here, Jennifer? Greg Seidel, Representative Ford Carr. He is here, good. And just so you all can think while he's coming to the mic, this completes our list. So if you do wanna speak, but you didn't sign up, we still wanna hear from you. So yes, Representative Carr. Thank you, I'm Representative Ford Carr from the 84th District here in Wichita. And I, First, I'd like to thank all those individuals who are standing out in the hall so that they could get to my name much sooner. <laughs> uh, the first, uh, my first uh, comment, and uh, thank you all for um, being here uh, and holding this, um, this particular event. Um, I, I would like to say um, first, and it's kind of um, uh, reiterating some of the comments that um, the speakers had said before me um, with regard to uh, the merger and the deal that was made um, at that particular time. Um, uh, I too feel um, uh, after listening to um, the a presentation that took place, you know, what's now, you know, at least three hours ago, that this is just an effort in which to make up, uh, excuse me, for, um, you know, what may have been um, uh, a bad deal at that time, you know, if we're talking at 2%, um, you know, I'm no mathematician, but, um, you know, you know, two times five is 10. And, and, and this is what we're asking for, um, is this, um, 10% increase that, uh, that now, um, based on, uh, other information, um, that I feel like we didn't get, um, as honestly as we should have, uh, it looks like it's going to be more than that. Um, my concern, however, is the 84th district that I represent um, has a, a population that um, whereby uh, nearly 25 percent of that district lives um, at or below the poverty level. Uh, I understand that, you know, we have the uh, cold energy plan um, whereby, uh, you know, we can't turn off the electric um, or the utilities um, during that, that uh, the time where um, those people might um, freeze to death. But as many other people have mentioned, um, you know, death can occur during the heat as well. Um, uh, and as much as I appreciate that cold energy plan, um, uh, based on the population that I represent and the fact that the reason that many of those people live at or below the poverty level is because they are on fixed incomes. Um, and again, we've heard people speak um, to the detriment that that can cause um, to an individual and or a household or family. Um, what I would like to implore upon um, Effergy um, is that uh, you make some considerations about some things that we might be able to do with respect to the um, warm weather and the hot temperatures. Um, because having your uh, electricity removed, you know, during the winter months um, is certainly detrimental, but it can be equally as detrimental if it's removed during the summer months. Um, so I would, I would I would like to present that to you and ask that you reach out to me um, or my office and let's discuss what can be done. Um, that being said, I do not agree with 
the amount of the percentage of the increase that in my opinion was um it was bad management as people have stated earlier um and i don't feel as though myself um any of the kansans in this room and certainly none of my constituents um should be responsible for paying for that and thank you again for coming thank you okay is there anyone else who would like to make a comment this evening that has not been yes i see you right there same on zoom if you've been sitting out there all night and you want to make a comment just raise your hand yes if you'll state your name please so my name is ken white and i live here in wichita and i i deal with uh, the commissioners on uh, on some other issues so they know i sometimes just have to talk um you energy folks, you're, you're, I think what we've discovered tonight is that you're a public relations nightmare. Um, whoever, and I, I'm being a proud Kansan, I, I, I'm hoping it was somebody in the Missouri office who said, hey, let's file a second rate increase before they even hear the first one. Um, just just really, really poor. I, I, and I, I, I hope you go back to the office and um, bring that up because they 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 haven't treated you well in this um some of what i'm going to say uh, people in the room or people who've talked before aren't going to agree with um um and and in my business i deal with a lot of the rural electric co-ops which are unregulated and quite frankly, you're, you're kind of stand up guys compared to them, uh, in, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, but there's still, but there's still the same, the, the same amount of issues, um, in the rural electric co-ops, uh, they ask for a rate increase and they have a board of directors, which is just kind of their, their local cronies. And, and they always, they always get whatever increase they ask for with, without question. And, um, I was at a, I was at a meeting in Ulysses with one of the, with Pioneer Electric and this happened and, and um, it was the same kind of thing. I was kind of there talking about business and there was one other, two other people talking about, you know, fixed income issues. And, and after the meeting, after, you know, they didn't even have us leave the room before they voted. Uh, after the meeting, I asked uh, the board members, um, what, how do you research this? How do you come to these decisions? And the board members said, oh, we just do whatever the management tells us to do. So we're lucky since, and the problem is, is those rural electric co-ops have monopolies too. So it, it, we're good we have this regulation. Um, one of the things that, that, that might upset a few of you, um, uh, there's been a lot of talk about renewable energy and there's really no such thing. Uh, the, the wind farms and the solar, they're supplemental is all they are. Um, you can't you can't go 100 percent on them. Uh, gentleman here who wants to sell trucks from from and and uh, charge up his trucks from 10 at the night and six in the morning. If you go to 100 percent supplemental energy, he can't do it because there's 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 just not enough generation. I'm actually worried about say five or 10 years in the future, if everybody really does c convert to electric vehicles, which I don't think is going to happen, but in the, in the unlikely event that actually happens, you can't, you can't supply and you don't have the, 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 the ability to wire every house in my neighborhood. Everybody has two electric cars in the, in the, uh, in their garage. And so I think we're going to be faced with some really, really large, um, really large rate increases uh at, at that point if 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 that happens um because it, it'll be a big boom for you but but you don't have the transmission capacity to to you know do fifty thousand electric cars in Wichita you just don't um so getting back to these supplemental energy sources and uh my friend Dennis Hedke here who served in the state legislature and he talks about it quite a bit and when and when he was on the was it the house committee energy environment he asked multiple times multiple times what effect do these supplemental energy sources have on our rates and he never could get an answer he could never get an answer out of you guys and i think in looking at 
this increase, I'd like to ask the commissioners if if they hadn't done what they'd done on the supplemental energy, would we be facing these rate increases of this one and the next one and the next one and the next one down the road? And I don't know if you can get a straight answer, but that's the real thing. A lot of the numbers that a lot of you people and pro and con people for, for the supplemental energy, a lot of the numbers they um, espouse aren't real like they use nameplate capacity, like like it's like saying you have a car that has a speedometer that'll go up to 200. And so your your car will go 200, you know, it doesn't mean the car will go 200 miles an hour. And a lot of the numbers that are thrown out on the supplementary energy are just like that. They use nameplate capacity and it probably doesn't have anything to do with not only what is generated there, but then after you have line loss and et cetera, et cetera, what actually gets consumed down the road. It's been said tonight, and, and I do think it's true, we, we, we have excess, we have excess capacity. We're building more excess capacity. You want to build more excess capacity for Panasonic. And I, I just I just don't see the logic that the more volume actually brings the rates down. Uh, you, you seem to be, and I, I, it always kind of boggles my mind and uh, my business is the same way. So it seems to me, you know, sometimes when companies get bigger, you'd think their costs would go down, you know, economies of scale and the, uh, uh, the electrical generation industry seems to be one of these, one of these industries that, that as they get bigger, um, the costs go up and, and I don't understand that. Um, so I guess, I guess my point is, like I said, I, I think, uh, there's been a lot of good things said tonight. Um, uh, some of it, I think, you know, made more sense than others, but, but the, but I, I think the cost of the supplemental energy really needs to be examined and, 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 um, see who's paying for that. Because all it is is supplemental. It can't, can't, can't hold us. Can't, can't, can't hold us through the whole thing. If you go 100, percent happy to see that you're uh, thinking about another natural gas plant. Um, you know, the coal is a mixed bag. I was, I was surprised to see the extension on the Jeffrey Energy Center, but um, I think because of the unreliability of the supplemental energy, I don't think you had any choice. We're, we're thank we're, you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mister White. Um, I'm looking at you, Mr. Fredoten. Is there anybody no. else that's no. raised their hand? No. Okay. Last time, folks, you've been here all evening. If you want to speak, now is the time. Um, yeah, uh, I'm not taking repeats. We will. I would like to remind everyone that the public comment period is open till 5 p.m. September 29th, and the materials. Oh, did he want to? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see you, Mr. Hedke. Did you want to speak? I apologize. I didn't see your hand. I appreciate the opportunity to rethink. I wanted to cool off a little bit after my first okay, round, I but I, I would say without any hesitation, any hesitation, that the legislation that was passed in 2009 in the Kansas State Building, Kansas State House, which mandated 20% renewables by 2020, was one of the biggest mistakes ever made inside that building. It unleashed unimaginable force and penetration of unreliable, expensive energy. Wind energy is not free at all, ever, nor solar. In 2009, I was appointed to the legislature, became chairman of the Energy Environment Committee in 2013. It took three years to get a simple bill passed that pushed back on the on the mandates and made this theoretically a free market opportunity for creation of wind of electrical energy in the state of Kansas. 
And as you know, Evergy, you took full advantage of what would have been a real true free market, but which was not tightly enough held in terms of the language of that House bill that was passed and sent signed by Governor Brownback. So you went ahead and made your own free market in Oklahoma and in other places. And now we know that Oklahoma, by some testimony given here tonight, has gone overboard and they're closing down their coal plants and they're replacing it with all kinds of wind energy, which is going to raise their rates incredibly higher. They don't have any idea what's coming down the pike. No idea. I can't believe the governor would, would even agree to sign that, that kind of legislation, but he did. So I beg you, as you review this rate increase application, to carefully consider how important it is to have full baseload reliability. And if you need somehow, for some reason, to pull in supplemental energy, as Ken had pointed out, then do that, but don't take away the base load. Don't cut Evergy out. Don't cut Jeffrey Energy out early. It's a good plant. It needs to, if anything, have con considerable opportunity to, to operate full out. And it's not doing that now, as you know. And that would be seen. And I would not retire one more coal plant in Kansas that still has the theoretical capacity to deliver good, reliable power. And don't go with the federal government's nonsense of pushing down on all of that opportunity for reliable power and get sucked into their illogical arguments because they are absolutely illogical. They make no sense. So uh, I implore the commission and Evergy to work together to try to find the right reliable solution to move forward for the state of Kansas and not fall prey to gobbledygook, we're not unreliable energy. I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Was there anybody else I missed? If there is, just stand up. Okay, thank you. I would like to remind everyone that the public comment period is open till 5 p.m. September 29th, and the materials that were handed out this evening outline the three ways in which the comments can be submitted for our consideration. The commission will hold an evidentiary hearing on this matter beginning on October 9th, 2023 at 9 a.m., at the commission offices in Topeka. The hearing will also be broadcast on the KCC's YouTube channel. The commission will issue a decision in this matter on or before January 4th, 2024. This concludes tonight's public hearing. We thank you for your participation and involvement this evening. Be safe driving home and be well. Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned. All right. Hi. Be safe going home.